this you also know like what uh, the community is expecting from us and what you feel about the presentations we have already chosen for this uh, meeting. Uh, today's session will be chaired by me and Doris. Doris, do you have anything to add? Okay, then without any further ado, I'd like to hand over the mic to our first presenter, Thomas, who will be presenting on XBGP faster innovation on routing protocols. Thomas. Hello, good morning, everyone. So I will present you XBGP, which is a new way to add programmability and innovation in routing protocols. So this is a joint work with uh, my colleague in UC Louvain, Belgium, but also with Laurent Vadbever and uh, Randy Bush. So the first question we can ask us is why we would like to bring programmability inside BGP. So you might know in modern network, you have routers from different vendor vendors for many reasons. So the first one are for economical and stability, stability reasons. For example, if you have one vendors that have a probably a crash or a bug, there is less chances that other vendors have the same problem. And so this is the first problem because um, all the vendors do not implement the same set of functionalities. And uh, this is really, uh, rest uh, really restrains the, um, the network operators about what they can do uh, on their networks. And so, well, operators would like to constantly tune their network for the evolvability of their networks, but they are limited by two main uh, factors. The first one is the network operating system, so the OS of the vendors. You can consider it as the black box, um, where you have only the interface provided by the, uh, by the vendor, but also by the standards itself, because you cannot do anything with uh, your implementation and your protocols. So uh, BGP are standardized by the, um, by the ITF. And so this is uh, something which is really constrained. Um, so for example, if I would like to add a simple functionality where would I, would, I would like to enhance the visibility of the BGP control plane, well, this is really complex. Uh, because if I have an intra domain routers that would like to uh, prefer, for example, European routes uh, among the other, I have no clues. Um, yeah, I agree that you can do this with uh, BGP communities, but this is really cumbersome and this is, um, you have to add a lot of configuration of all your routers of your, uh, of your network. And this is why there are a draft that has been um, proposed in 2016, where uh, they simply add a new BGP attribute uh, to add the latitude and longitude of the router that received the route. Um, so the idea is really simple. Each time you receive a um, BGP update from your peers, you add the latitude, latitude and longitude of the router who received the, uh, the update. You spread the information inside uh, the network. And then to avoid pollute the internet with your custom attributes, you remove it on the edge routers of, uh, of the network. So this is quite easy to understand and to maybe implement, but not at all, because there is a lot of process to uh, achieve this uh, uh, this feature inside uh, BGP. So the first one is the standardization step. So in order that all the routers must um, talk the same language, I would say. And so the, the, there are a standardization process by the ITF. And here on the slide, you have the standardization delay of the 40 RFCs related to BGP. And you can see that in median, you have to wait roughly four years to have one standard for one feature. But that's not all, because you have also to wait uh, vendors to implement your feature inside uh, the, 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 the router. And finally, you have to update your routers. But the problem is if you want to add a new functionality as a small network, let's consider Belnet, which is a small research network in Belgium, you cannot easily influence step one and step two because you maybe some uh, IETF people do not have the, the same um, idea uh, as you and do, uh, do not in, uh, are, are not interested by your, your feature and also the vendor side is um, it's also complex because you can't you maybe not have the right license to add um, a new, to ask for a new functionality inside uh, the network and finally yeah you have to update the router but this is something you can fetch from uh, from the vendor Okay, so let's us uh, summarize the main problem inside B uh, BGP or routing protocol in general. So the first problem is that you have routers from different vendors, then uh, protocol extension do are not implemented in all routers. 
Anyway, I've also the slow upgrade process uh, as I, I explained uh, before. And with XBGP, we would like to bring innovation back and programmability inside routing protocols. Um, okay, so now I will explain the basic of XBGP and let me just introduce how we can um, update in a classical way our routers. So this is the vendor that must add and implement it inside their uh, routing vendor, uh, their routing, uh, routing uh, uh, stack, the new feature, then I, they need to compile it and generate an image that the network operator can fetch and update to, to, its, uh, to its network. But during this process, the, or the operators must to uh, uh, flash the router and reload the session, and so they will lose all the neighboring session, all the peer, the routing, uh, the routing peers they have um, established uh, with other other people. And so, yeah, to bypass this classical update, I would say I will uh, we will leverage eBPF, which is basically two core components. So the first one is an eBPF bytecode. So this is a bytecode which is multi-architecture compatible, which is really uh, nice for our use cases because uh, routers have uh, CPUs from different ar architecture. And then you have a runtime environment that will fetch the bytecode and execute it inside an isolated environment. So you can think about a kind of uh, Java virtual machine. And so. With this uh, eBPF um, technology, what we can do is first, uh, as a router vendor, uh, you have to add it inside your, um, your routers. And then if you want to add a new functionality as a network operator, you will um, simply write your own plugin, XBGP extension, then compile it inside uh, on eBPF, sorry, and then uh, inject it inside the eBPF virtual machine that will interact with the, 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 the vendors so that they can fetch the, the right data, data structure to compute the, the functional, functionality. And thanks to this method, you don't have to reboot or flash a new image in your, in your router. Okay, so with this uh, view, we would like to uh, shift uh, from another paradigm where now we have something which is more black box where vendors have the full control on uh, their router toward uh, something more gray where you have the BGP code which is closed source for uh, the, uh, the vendors, but where you can interact with this code with uh, the eBP virtual machine and so the network operator have a way to uh, influence its uh, router. Okay, so how we managed to um, make uh, XBGP compliant uh, and uh, BGP implementation? Um, for that, we rely on the BGP workflow that has been defined in RFC 4271. And this workflow normally is uh, implemented on all BGP implementations. And the BGP workflow is uh, the following. Each time we receive a BGP messages from your peers, they goes to the theoretical edge ribbon then you have uh, import filters to apply some policies. You have, uh, after, uh, after all the route, we go to the, uh, the lock rip. Then you have the BGP decision process that will select the best route toward, toward each prefix. Then again, export filter, they go to the add revote, and finally you uh, announce the best route to your neighbors. Okay. So this is the, the workflow, but how to access this workflow? Because on traditional implementation of BGP, you have only the interfaces provided by the, by the vendor. The famous one are CLI, NetConf, or SNMP for monitoring. And with XBGP, we open the lid of a BGP, sorry, and uh, we expose this BGP workflow so that the XBGP virtual machine will um, execute uh, or extend your extension to this BGP workflow. And so, yeah, if I take back my geographical location plugin that I uh, introduced uh, previously, uh, it needs to be executed somewhere. And uh, for that, we introduce insertion points. So there, those are the green, the green circle here on the on the figure, where you can execute any code uh, from the from the operator. And so, yeah, the geographical location uh, extension is divided in subparts, so it must uh, cover the whole uh, BGP workflow. And you have to first decode the geographical location that has been uh, sent from your peers. You have to add it inside the route. 
use it, delete it, and encode it. And those subparts will go to the right insertion point, and the VM will manage to execute this uh, subpart of the plugin uh, to the right uh, location of uh, the BGP workflow. Okay, so thanks to that, we have to implement once uh, the geographical location extension, then it will be uh, executed on every implementation of, of BGP, or at least those that, that are XBGP compatible. And, and we successfully managed to uh, um, modify BIRD and FL routing to add our XBGP layer so that the eBPF virtual machine can execute uh, any plugin that the operator can, uh, can provide. So you can think as XBGP as a, a link between the operators and the vendors. So the vendors will provide the OS, so uh, with the, the routing information table, the peer state, the memory, IO, BGP state, uh, BGP state and, and stuff like that. And the operators will interact with the XBGP layer so that uh, they will and they can inter interact with those um, subparts of the network operating system. And so the advantage is that you only implement once your um, XBGP layer on each uh, BGP implementation, and that's it. You can uh, now um, execute your uh, uh, plugins, your XBGP extension. So, um, so this is just an, for your information. We had to mod slightly modify FL routing and BIRD because we do not have all the um, information to execute our uh, XBGP stuff. So for your information, we had to modify some line of code inside both FL routing and BIRD. So this is uh, just uh, some line of code we have had to modify. Um, of course, we have also implemented other use cases to prove that the solution is really, um, that covered a lot of uh, use cases that the operator might want to add inside uh, their network. So I won't explain them in details in this presentation, but I will just explain it, uh, explain one of them, which is the BGP zombies. What is the BGP zombies? So this is simply um, routes that are not no more reachable, but still in the routing table of some part of the routers in, in, the, in the internet. So normally, if you have a prefix P and you would like to advertise to other uh, peers inside the internet, you have to rely on routing um, protocols here BGP to announce your uh, update to, uh, to the rest of the internet. But for some reason, the prefix P is unreachable anymore. And so uh, the routers that detect it will uh, announce a withdraw to other routers so that the, the route is not reachable to the internet. But for some reason, part uh, one uh, routers, maybe for a bug or some something uh, other, other thing, will not um, process correctly the withdraw and will not um, announce the withdrawal to other routers. So, th so there is a, a network that is split it in two. You have some router that have the information that the prefix P is not reachable anymore, and other uh, routers that still have the route, and this will cause a lot of problems such as black holing and so on. But with XBGP, you can actually um, add a new plugin that will check the routing table each, uh, each, uh, each night, uh, for example, and if the, the route is in the routing table uh, in um, order than a uh, unit of time, so maybe, for example, four weeks, then you can ask to your upstream routers to confirm if the, the route is still valid. And if it is it's still valid, then uh, the router will uh, make the con corresponding um, exchange of message to, to say, okay, so the route is still, is still reachable or not. So this, this is a quite uh, special um, use case because it does not uh, directly influence the BGP workflow of uh, BGP, but this is more related as a, maybe I would like to say cron job or background task. And so we have a kind of insertion point where you can execute some of the, these, um, these tasks for maybe for maintenance uh, stuff and so on. Um, Okay, so now we have a way to add programmability and um, innovation inside network, but one question now is, does using XBGP have an impact on router performance? And to, ask, to answer this uh, question, we have made a small experiment where uh, we have made a, um, a left router to uh, inject a full routing table to our XBGP routers, and we measure the conversion time of uh, this green router. And the first thing we uh, managed to do is 
to check if there is any additional overhead or not, if there is no XBGP program that are executed inside the routers. And of, actually, there is a small overhead because you have to initialize some data structure related to XBGP and also to check if there is uh, some, some plugin which is inside uh, the implementation. So there is a slight overhead. And also, we have considered a worst case which is the re-implementation of route reflection. So we believe that this uh, use case is a um, complex one for uh, XBGP. And um, this is the worst uh, use case you can have. And there is a quite high overhead, I would say. Uh, for FL routing, you have a conversion type of plus 13% and BERT 8%. Um, yeah, so this, 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 the difference is explained by uh, the data, data serialization between FL routing and BERT. This, this was more easy for F, uh, XBGP to convert a data structure to a um, vendor neutral um, structure that the, uh, the XBGP extension can, um, uh, can use inside uh, the plugin. And also that um, the eBPF uh, JIT compiler is not efficient as native uh, bytecode, but this is still a prototype. Uh, there, are, there is still uh, some improvement to be made inside, uh, inside the prototype of XBGP. Um, so the last thing I would like to, um, to share is, yeah, now we have something to add a new feature inside routers, but the, um, the code that is executed and written by the operators is untrusted from the point of view of the routers. And so if I take back my geographical location extension, maybe this uh, one has not been um, correctly written. There are some corner cases that I, not, I do not um, uh, think when the, during the development process. And so th this could crash the routers and this is something we do not want. Uh, because routers are generally expected to run uh, 24 hours out of 24. And so we managed to uh, develop a kind of uh, framework on top of offline verification tools where you have to pass the source code of your extension, annotate it with a custom um, verification macro that we have uh, uh, developed, and then uh, those, uh, this uh, source code with annotation will be um, passed to uh, the offline verification tools. If all the properties are satisfied, then you can uh, compile it to eBPF bytecode and then eject it to your router. So there are a lot of properties. So there are basic one and properties related to BGP. So the basic properties are the termination. Uh, we do not want that the, the plugin is stuck in an infinite loop and to uh, completely break the, the, the router. There are also question of memory safety. So our uh, prototype is running um, on top of C code. Uh, but I agree that if you want, if you write your, um, your extension in Rust, for example, uh, then the question does not arise. And there are also some stuff about uh, virtual machine isolation and API restriction. So, for example, if I want, I would like to um, to use some part of the API of XBGP, but I not allowed. Then uh, there are a runtime uh, check that has made uh, the, uh, on our um, framework. But the most important one is uh, the properties related to uh, to BGP. And I will also uh, retake my example of Geolock, um, where when you want to add and when you want to advertise this uh, feature and this uh, attribute inside your uh, routers, they must satisfy a wire format and header. And so uh, what you have to do is to uh, write and annotate your uh, source code with the corresponding, um, uh, the corresponding um, value. So for example, the flag must be eight, the type code must be two A and so on. Also the latitude and longitude must be valid in uh, a valid location on the earth. So yeah, so you have to, to write it yourself and then uh, the offline verification tools will uh, make sure that the, the header is correctly formatted. Um, so this concludes my presentation. So we believe that with XBGP, BGP implementation will become truly extensible. Um, we have made the job for BGP, but uh, we believe that the same methodology can be applied to other routing protocols such as ISIS or SPF. Uh, and if you are interested to interested to know more about the internal, the use case, and other stuff that we can do with XBGP, you can check the corresponding paper. Thank you.
Thomas, do you have any questions? Hi. Hi. Barry Todorovic from Juniper Networks. I have just one question. Uh, uh, I guess uh, you tested uh, this uh, uh, feature on uh, a number of vendors. Which vendors uh, did you test? We only uh, tested on FR routing and BERT. We do not have access to other uh, vendors' implementation, so we do not have made uh, the job. But we would like to be happy to have some implementation to put the XBGP stuff on real uh, vendors. Okay, that's uh, why my, my question because, uh, for instance, some vendors and including my uh, company that I've worked with for uh, have uh, uh, the, the possibilities to add some uh, code uh, that would be, uh, uh, let's say, a kind of a custom code that can be executed on the box. And I'm not talking only about scripting. For instance, we have a within Juniper uh, the programmable RPD, which pro provides you exact, exactly the access to. Uh, the routing uh, part of uh, the router where you can uh, to, to do the control plane where you can add your own uh, features so that might be interesting for you. Okay, nice to know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We have one comment from online from Sander Stefan from Six Connect. Uh, he's just saying uh, awesome work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. I think we don't have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now I'll invite one of my old friends, Robbie, for an interesting presentation on indexing Europe's internal and talents. Robbie. Hello, hello, hello. There we go. Howdy, all. Um, thank you very much for coming and staying to the end of the conference. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, as for my other speakers speaking this morning, um, today I'm talking about uh, the Internet Society's uh, efforts to uh, help decision makers understand the Internet's resilience um, and a little bit about the health and evolution of the Internet at the same time. And what I hope uh, you leave with here today is that it's worth keeping abreast of the resilience of your and your country's um, internet ecosystem as much as it is your own network, uh, as there's plenty to learn uh, from the strengths and weaknesses and plenty of insight that you can offer uh, to improve the overall health of the internet. That way, that way, this way. There we go. Um, as an overview, um, I'll discuss three case studies of how internet resilience in North America, Europe and Australia has been compromised in the past 17 or so months. Uh, I'll then share a snapshot of Europe's internet resilience um, and highlight some of the strengths and weaknesses. And finally, I'll discuss uh, the need to improve national and regional internet ecosystem data resolution uh, to allow decision makers to make a uh, better informed decisions. So uh, Internet Society has been running its Measuring the Internet project for around three years. Um, its outward facing product is the Pulse uh, platform, uh, which curates open source data to examine internet trends uh, and tell data driven stories so that decision makers and others can better understand the health, availability and evolution of the internet. Our current focus areas are to do with internet shutdowns. Uh, so we have an internet shutdown tracker and recently released a economic tool to show the uh, economic costs of internet shutdowns uh, called net loss. Uh, the state of deployment of uh, enabling technologies, IPv6, HTTPS, DNSSEC, TLS 1.3. Uh, the concentration of infrastructure services and markets, and finally, the resilience of internet in more than 170 countries. So regarding the last of these focuses, uh, we developed the Internet Resilience Index, which I'll refer to in this presentation as IRI. Uh, 
And this draws upon around 20 open data sources uh, and uses best practice methodologies to calculate a snapshot of a country's internet resilience in terms of its infrastructure, uh, its performance, security, and market readiness. Um, I'll speak to each of these, uh, what we call pillars, uh, as I uh, go through my presentation, as well as the metrics uh, within these pillars. Before I do get into the uh, IRI, I, I want to put this into context uh, and advocate how, um, oh, sorry, put it into context and note three case studies of where uh, a country's internet resilience has been shown up in the past 18 months, uh, particularly in Australia, Canada and Italy. So the most recent uh, of these incidents, as many of you will be aware of, uh, happened uh, last month in Australia, now last month, we're in December, uh, where a minor technical slip up uh, by the second largest operator caused one third of Australians to lose internet and mobile connectivity and disrupted emergency services, hospitals, banks, ATMs, the lot. Uh, while there has been no root cause analysis uh, forthcoming yet, uh, plenty of commentary is swirling around uh, as to what happened. One of my colleagues, uh, Aftab Siddiqui, noted on the Pulse blog that the warning signs of Optus's lack of resilience compared to other carriers were apparent, most notably their disengagement with local peering. Uh, most likely case of this was um, down to uh, business market uh, strategy. Um, but it does overlook uh, the opportunity to bolster network resilience through diverse connection points, uh, a metric that we consider as part of the R IRI. So this is the uh, Internet Resilience Index profile for Australia. Um, while it does not offer insight at a network level, it offers it at that national level, uh, and it shows how concentrated the market is in Australia. Uh, looking at the uh, upstream provider diversity and market diversity. If you're familiar with Australia's uh, telecommunication market, it's really a two and a half horse race, which isn't too dissimilar to a lot of countries around the world. Given the wide uh, ranging severity of the outage, the Australian government quickly ordered an inquiry uh, to examine the roaming and emergency services impacted uh, and have um, already uh, put forward uh, suggestions as to whether rival telcos can offer access uh, to their services during network shutdowns. Uh, it also plans to investigate the adequacy of Optus's uh, communications on the day of the outage. The second case study uh, uh, shares similar traits to the first, including a chief executive, um, no longer a chief executive at either of these organisations. The Rogers outage uh, in 2022, July 2022, spread uh, across Rogers cable, mobile and fixed line services and directly affected all of its 12 million uh, subscribers and indirectly prevented all businesses nationwide from being able to accept debit card transactions, uh, affected several government agencies, including border security impacted timing of one quarter of traffic lights in the Toronto area and denied access to 911 emergency calls. Overall, it was estimated to have cost the Canadian government 142 million USD and Rogers 150 USD uh, in customer credits. Like Optus, Rogers has never been forthcoming with a root cause analysis, uh, except for noting that the outage was resulted uh, from a configuration change that uh, deleted a route filter flooding certain network routing equipment and resulting in a core network failure with broad impact. Rogers has acknowledged the need to plan and implement network separation of wireless and wireline core functions and it's currently spending $261 million on doing this. Um, the interesting thing will be since uh, the merger between Rogers and Shaw is going through, whether or not that will also include uh, Shaw uh, being diversified as well under that umbrella. 
If we look at the IRI profile for Canada, you can see the upstream provider diversity is about the same as Australia. Uh, so 37%, um, but its market diversity is quite a bit higher than Australia at uh, 59%. It will be interesting again to see how this will change with that merger between uh, Rogers and Shaw. Like the Australian incident, uh, I think the Australian government was aware, uh, understanding of what happened in Canada and Canada implemented the things that Australia is now going through and looking into the inquiry. The final incident I wanted to draw your attention to happened here in Italy uh, this year, um, uh, where again, nearly a third of internet users in the country were left without internet connectivity for five hours this time. Uh, like the other two incidents, uh, the ISPs in question uh, haven't been forthcoming with a root cause analysis, uh, but still thanks to the analysis from the community, including um, a former colleague, Max Stucci here in the front row, um, it was apparent that the issue was related to a lack of redundancy on the side of uh, Tim, the op 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 operator and its upstream provider Sparkle, which is a part of the parent company as well, uh, combined with a lack of local peering. So as seen here on um, Hurricane Electric BGP toolkit, uh, Tim relies only on Sparkle for international connectivity. Uh, and if we compare that to Vodafone Italy, uh, it has five upstream providers. This setup provides plenty of redundancy when one of these upstreams has an outage, as we know. If we look at Italy's IRI, it's interesting to note how upstream diversity ranks highest of all three of these countries, <laughs> uh, which does point to a slight limitation of what this index is and why you as a community also need to provide insight into thing, uh, tools like these and metrics like these when decision makers look at them and say, upstream di provide diversity, we look pretty safe for that, uh, but it's, often common knowledge within the technical community that there are these uh, pressure points uh, that need to be addressed. Okay, so internet resilience of Europe. Uh, Europe uh, leads all other um, uh, regions in the world uh, by a fair margin. Um, of the top 10 countries, nine are from the European region, uh, with Switzerland and Iceland uh, leading all. Uh, if we look at Switzerland uh, profile, we can see that they don't have many weaknesses, uh, though we can note that their market diversity is lower than that of the previous countries. We do need to take into account that Switzerland's population is a lot lower than those other countries. So it's always going to be difficult to increase market diversity in smaller populated countries. Um, the one interesting outlier I found from this though was their DDoS protection is very low. Uh, and that can be something that could be addressed fairly simply. Similarly, Iceland has many strengths uh, with IP, IPv6 adoption and again, market diversity being among its weakest resilience metrics. Uh, it's gonna be difficult to see IPv6 uh, increasing there. Again, low population, uh, low um, diversity of networks. They've already got plenty of IPv4, I imagine, but as the rest of the world connects to IPv6, I'm sure they'll catch up. Uh, of note with both countries, uh, they've need to um, overcome uh, differing challenges with establishing uh, their prominence uh, in internet connectivity. Uh, one being a landlocked country, uh, highly mountainous. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, physical infrastructure that associated with trying to overcome that. And one being an island and highly volcanic, uh, which I'll get to later on where we are looking at also how uh, natural and climate uh, changes, uh, we will be able to involve that into the resilience index too. One country I wanted to highlight uh, of Europe's uh, top uh, is Bulgaria, uh, which ranks fifth in Europe and sixth globally. Um, 
and of course first in Eastern Europe. Uh, this is interesting when considering as per the Brookings report from 2021, Bulgaria still lags behind the rest of Europe uh, regarding adopting digital technologies. So they're right down the end there. Um, poor digital literacy and skills, low levels of investment and research and development, uh, incomplete digitalization of public services, are perceived to be holding the country back, and yet they have one of the most resilient internet ecosystems in the world. <laughs> and the ICT sector has grown to become the country's top expert in uh, export and services. I just read also that uh, last week or the week before, the government has also committed another 260 million uh, euro uh, in uh, increasing its uh, broadband infrastructure to rural, serve, uh, rural communities. Um, so they're not sitting on their laurels. Um, and with that, there's still plenty of room as well for them to make changes and even lead uh, internet resilience for the rest of the world. We couldn't imagine to see their fibre to 10 kilometre reach increasing with those new investments, uh, but easily they can um, start deploying IPv6, which will get uh, greater uh, increases in, IP in their security uh, pillar score, as well as DDoS protection, just like Switzerland. Um, and increasing its peering uh, with its seven IXPs, which is quite high for, uh, again, the population, which I think uh, Bulgaria is around five to seven million. Someone can correct me. Uh, if we turn the attention to the countries with the weakest uh, resilient internet ecosystems in Europe, uh, we can see there's plenty of opportunity uh, for Europe to increase its overall resilience collectively. Uh, more so, we can highlight the importance of resilience at a country level by looking at the country that has had perhaps had the ecosystem, internet ecosystem come under the most amount of stress in the past 18 months. So Ukraine has been a role model uh, for Eastern Europe for many years and has consistently scored relatively high uh, on the four pillars of the IRI. Uh, having said Having this solid base has particularly helped, uh, particularly in its infrastructure and security um, and market readiness has helped it um, maintain its internet, internet connectivity during the war. Uh, four metrics that I wanted to draw your attention to specifically are the number of IXPs. Uh, it has 27 IXPs in country. It's MANAS score, uh, where it's routing hygiene scores at 63, MANAS at 72%, uh, upstream redundancy and market diversity. All these have helped insulate local connectivity in many ways uh, from the targeted attacks that Russia has made on the Ukraine infrastructure. As you can see here, it has strong local peering fabric. Importantly, this hasn't changed uh, very much, uh, even though 100 ASs have um, transferred out of the country, most to Russia. And while Kyivstar is the dominant ISP in the country, uh, multiple other providers uh, provision more than three quarters of the remaining traffic. Uh, this has been especially important given that Kyivstar has experienced increased latency and decreased throughputs over the last 18 to 22 months. Notably, 71% of networks are implementing best current routing security practices. 99% of which have documented their routing announcements in the IRR and 40% in RPKI. So there's good practices happening still. While we don't yet show uh, exit points uh, in the index, uh, we recognize it as an essential indicator of a country's internet resilience. But to give you some idea of those metrics, uh, we don't yet involve it because we don't have enough data points uh, to be able to show for a certain amount of countries. Uh, Ukraine has no submarine cables uh, but, and relies purely on terrestrial links uh, with its neighbouring countries, which it thankfully has many neighbouring countries that aren't at war with it. So Limitations I, point, I touched on earlier. What I've shown you here is merely a guide and some of you may have scoffed at some of the data 
and scores and sources, and you may have your own data and sources uh, that say something totally different. What we're trying to do with this tool is to make it these open data sources more readily available to decision makers so that they can make a sense of, uh, get a sense of uh, that internet ecosystem at a higher level um, and demonstrating the various aspects of the internet as well. Uh, and I pointed to how we need the technical community as well to make sense of this along the way. Um, by no means do I say this is a source of truth. Uh, it does provide a digestible view of what is going to help you and especially the decision makers identify weaknesses and hopefully guide research into validating what we see with those gaps. To this point, uh, we advocate for greater localised data sourcing and sharing, uh, which provides greater resolution to what is really happening at the edge. So more RIPE Atlas, more UNI probes, go. Uh, this is also the first version of the index framework and we plan to expand it to include new metrics, uh, including resilient countries, in, uh, uh, how resilient a country's uh, ecosystem is to natural and climate disasters. That's something planned for 2024. To conclude, understanding what's happening upstream and beyond your country's borders is equally important as knowing your network's health. You may want to know that the networks you're peering with and the routes you're taking are resilient, uh, so you won't be up for any sudden costs uh, or purchase to purchase capacity on the chance of any mishap. Some of you may also be servicing customers in other countries or are uh, considering doing so. And again, knowing the internet resilience of those countries and the links between them can help you understand the risks and where you might need to invest. And furthermore, having an insightful and national measurement system in place helps validate this sort of data that we and decision makers are becoming more reliant on to help us address the weaknesses in the ecosystem. And while it's unfortunate that others have mishaps, you can learn from them and should share your own mishaps and successes in forums just like these and local NOGs so that others can learn from you and them too. As the adage goes, it's not a case of if, but when, but the impact doesn't necessarily have to follow those who've already been impacted. Finally, if you're interested in keeping abreast of all things about the project, please subscribe to our monthly newsletter. Uh, if you want to partner with us uh, and learn more, contact us through pulse at isoc.org. And I've also put a link there to the methodology for the index so you can understand the sources and relative calculations associated with getting to the scores. Grazie. Any questions? Torres, do you have any questions? Not currently. Easy. Okay. Thank you, Thank Robbie. You. Thanks for your presentation. Now we have an uh, lightning talk and we'll call Mariano for an interesting project, Rosti, Mariano. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this presentation. Uh, today, I will talk uh, about uh, our ongoing project uh, called Roset uh, in collaboration with uh, Antonio Prado and Tommaso Cagliazzi. So uh, we all know that uh, routing security is really important nowadays, and uh, the Manners Initiative is playing a key role in making the internet a safer place. Uh, in this talk, I will uh, mainly focus on the Manners uh, Network Operators Guidelines and uh, um, briefly um, like uh, summarize them in this slide. Uh, they are coordination, global information, anti-spoofing and filtering. And uh, these are the four actions that a network operator must perform to verify Manners compliance. Okay, after reading them, I ask, uh, 
le let's assume I'm a network operator and I want to ensure that uh, my network is manners compliant. How can I verify this? So, um, okay. Uh, the reality is that, that no, uh, there is no automatic and comprehensive tool to, to verify manners compliance. And so the validation is done uh, manually by the operators and becomes a cumbersome uh, process uh, because they have to manually uh, like verify and uh, the configurations and policies and this also makes difficult to replicate the the process in case this is needed so yes while ensuring manners compliance uh, is crucial uh, it's not an easy task so to address this problem in this talk i will briefly present uh, roset which is the first open source tool to automatically verify manners compliance uh, since the time is not uh, enough, I will briefly go uh, to the uh, inside of the process. And so, uh, first, the candidate provides the AS number, and from this we can get the IRR entry uh, and parse the outnum objects. And uh, for now, we rely on a manual uh, parsing of the RPS uh, lang uh, uh, syntax, but we we plan to to switch to better services such as IRRD. Then we also take the latest rib dump uh, from a route collector. And from this, we can filter out the routes originated by the candidate uh, AS by checking the AS, AS path. So now we have a, a prologue script that will check if the uh, networks announced the, to the transits in the wild are the same as the ones uh, declared in the IRR entry and vice versa. Um, um, Okay. okay, at this point, uh, we can take uh, the vendor configuration that is uh, provided by the candidate, and we need to transform it uh, into an agnostic <clears throat> format that can be easily processed in the rest of the pipeline. So how can we do that? Uh, it, currently, in Roset, we exploit Batfish uh, that understands most of the vendor syntaxes uh, and transforms them into a unified format. Uh, but uh, during the process, we noticed that uh, Batfish output uh, lacks uh, some important information, such as it's, uh, it, it doesn't support IPv6. So we use the Batfish output, output as a baseline, and then we extract uh, uh, the missing information with uh, our custom parser. Indeed, we use the Batfish uh, in this phase of the project to fast iterate on it, but we plan to switch to a custom full parser ma made by, by us. So now we have a data structure that holds the important information into an agnostic format, but we don't know the relationships between the AISs inside this configuration. And so we again rely on the IRR entry to set the configurations between the autonomous systems. And for being uh, compliant to a realistic network, we plug a dummy OTT, which is connected to all the providers of this uh, small network. So now we again use the rib dump uh, to add uh, on each autonomous system the prefixes that are originated by each AS. So these sum up uh, the small network that uh, behaves like a realistic one connected to the, to the candidate. In this example, we only uh, show the, 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 how Rosette handles the direct peerings, but we also support multi-op peerings from the candidate AS towards the other autonomous systems uh, with a slightly complex uh, syntax and logic. So at this point, uh, we transform this intermediate representation into a runnable network scenario. And uh, to run the, the, this scenario, we rely on the emulation and particularly, particularly on Kadara, which is an open source network emula emulator based on containers. Uh, so uh, each uh, autonomous system of this representation is then uh, converted into a router. And for all the routers, except the, the candidate one, we use FR routing as the routing suite. As for the candidate router, uh, we use the specific uh, vendor uh, container that is derived uh, from the configuration provided by the candidate. And for now, we support uh, Cisco, iOS, XR, and Junos. But indeed, we plan to, to support other vendors uh, since the, the architecture can be easily extended to do that. Uh, so after waiting a bit for the network convergence, we can start performing the actual verification. Uh, before that, uh, I, we had two hosts that will be used uh, uh, to perform uh, the, the tests. So for time reasons, I will only show how the anti-spoofing check is performed. Um, 
for, for doing that, we take the providers and for each one of them, we first add a client inside the same autonomous system. Uh, we then assign both IPv4 and v6 addresses to each client. And the challenge here is to choose subnets that are correctly announced and mutually reachable uh, from the information that we have at our disposal and from the emulated network. Uh, another challenge is to select a valid random IP address uh, to assign to the internet host. Uh, and this uh, address and the subnet should not overlap with the other networks uh, uh, announced inside this small network. And once we choose it, this subnet will act as the malicious uh, subnet. So now, now we perform the actual check. And uh, uh, to do that, we put a TCP dump on the internet host to sniff packets. And using SCAPI, we craft a ECMP packet from the candidate client. And uh, this, this, this packet will have the spoofed IP as the source and the provider client IP as the destination. Now we send this packet, this packet and two conditions uh, can arise. If the packet is forwarded by the candidate router uh, towards the, the provider, then we check if the packet is then received by the internet client. If so, it means the, that the configuration is not compliant with this uh, uh, action. In another case, if the candidate correctly blocks the packet, so no packet is received by the internet client, and so the configuration can be uh, like handled um, as compliant. As a double check, we also verify that legit packets are correctly forwarded and received by the provider host. So to conclude, I briefly presented Roset, which is the first tool to automatically verify Manners compliance. Uh, Roset allows network operators to finally test their configurations without relying on manual and error-prone procedures, and this will surely help in the ad adoption of the manners principles if the, this project becomes widespread, which I hope. Uh, indeed, the work is preliminary, and sure, there is, there is a lot of future work. The first step is to extend uh, the, re the verification from a single router to multiple routers. Then uh, we plan to extend the verification to also IXPs and uh, uh, the CDN cloud uh, providers. Moreover, the tool was born to, to verify manners, but uh, uh, we also plan to have additional support, for example, to validate their PKI deployment of the, of the candidate or ASPA. Uh, another cool feature that could be implemented is to release a code, for example, a, a certificate that uh, is a tangible proof that a certain network is manners compliance. And uh, lastly, uh, the, the tool is right now CLI based, but uh, we plan and we hope to, to, to um, uh, pack it into a web UI. So I'm at the end, thank you for the attention. And as I said, Roset is an open source tool, so you can check uh, more on the GitHub repository and uh, we are super happy of any contribution by the community. Thank you. We have a minute for some questions. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Andrei Arbashevsky, Internet Society Manners. Uh, I would like to congratulate your team. That's a great tool. And um, we're thinking of something like this. We're developing, there is a working group called Manners Plus to develop even more profound checks on Manners conformance. And I think this tool might sort of fill this last piece of the puzzle that allows operators also prepare for Manners and also to verify that their configuration is correct. Thank you very yeah. much. And I hope uh, we co co collaborate on that. Sure, thank you. No questions online. Okay, thanks Mariano for the presentation. Uh, there was a huge outage at AMS IX on 22nd and 23rd November, and Stavros is actually going to present on the postmortem analysis for this outage. Stavros. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm here on stage to present you not a very nice topic or a fun project. But I hope you had a good night yesterday, so at least we can compensate on that. I had, because my voice is not very good. Um, okay, I'm going to 
explain you briefly what happened last week uh, in Amsterdam Internet Exchange, where we experienced uh, a big outage. And I'm going to take you via the technical details of this outage. Uh, as you can see, I'm a senior network engineer uh, from the AM6NOC, so I have first-hand experience with this uh, case. Um, before we start this uh, presentation, I would like to mention, to say to you guys that uh, some vendor names will be mentioned here, and that's uh, about to make your life easier to understand what happened and in which part of the platform and the network, but it's not about to blame anyone, right? We're not blaming people or vendors here. It's about uh, sharing knowledge with uh, you, with the community, with, uh, with our uh, colleagues from uh, other IXPs. And, uh, okay, we might have had an outage, but so far we had already seven migrations, uh, putting new machines in the network from, from the new vendor in such a short period, and everything was super good and super smooth. So sometimes things, uh, things can go wrong. So uh, let's go further. A uh, quick, very quick recap of the AM6 platform uh, so far that you can go in our website and you can see. It's a spine leaf uh, topology uh, in a dual asterisk. It has uh, two MPLS cores and all the other are uh, PE routers. And, uh, and on front of every PE router, there is a photonic cross-connect, which means that in every collocation, in every data center, we deploy two PE routers and a photonic cross-connect, which works as a demarcation point for our customers. Uh, the network consists of uh, three generation of uh, equipment. We have some very old uh, brocade uh, MLXE, 16s and 32s. Uh, the second generation is the Extreme SLX 19850s, which they support uh, uh, a lot of 100G connections. And we started recently adopting the Juniper MX10K8 platform in the network as uh, Juniper is the new vendor for us for the future. Uh, the protocol stack that we are using is not something unusual. We are a little bit behind compared to the industry. We are still using MPLS, VPLS. OSPF is the underlay protocol to, 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 to give some uh, signaling on the point-to-point -point interfaces. Uh, we use LDP for uh, label distribution and RSVPTE to provision uh, strict uh, paths between the machines and LACP, of course, for aggregating uh, connections of customers, but also in the backbone network. So what happened on Wednesday afternoon uh, where everything started, right? So around nine, 7 o'clock uh, Amsterdam time, we noticed that uh, customers on Science Park campus uh, moved automatically. Uh, from one P router to another P router. That happens automatically with us uh, by using the photonic uh, cross-connect machines, the demarcation points, uh, where we have uh, scripts and systems that monitor the status of the network. And if the machine experiences a failure, then all customers swap automatically with this layer one switches to the other P router. So this is what happened in an automatic way. And then people started immediately looking, okay, what happened? Perhaps a machine crashed, a line card, or we had these issues in the past. We are very experienced on handling them. But soon we realized that there is more meat on this case. Uh, as customers started reporting uh, loss of traffic, uh, lots of unstable connections, and a lot of uh, unreachable remote uh, peers. So we saw, OK, that's something bigger than we expected or what we have experienced in the past. Uh, and we started investigating, but quickly we couldn't find that, uh, that the issue was uh, Per a particular PE router or a particular collocation, it was all over the platform. And uh, when we were going through the logs, we saw lots of RSVP messages. So it means that okay, the network is not super stable. Uh, we had a small clue, however, at that point uh, we saw uh, a lot of unstable lag connections, link aggregation connections. But okay, at that moment could not help us much with the investigation. So what we did, uh, okay, as you can understand, all the knock hands were on the call, we, on the table, everybody uh, immobilized, the crisis button was pushed, and uh, we started looking into the case. Uh, we immediately engaged the extreme networks uh, tag because, okay, we saw a machine, an SLX machine had an issue. So it was, it was a logical step to call the extreme tag to help us identify the root cause. Uh, we saw a lot of RSVP sessions flapping uh, at that moment. Uh, we had disconnected a suspicious customer who connected to the network like two hours before. 
So we saw, mm, okay, might be this guy that creates an issue. We disconnected him, but uh, things uh, didn't improve. So we started looking further and uh, we recognized the known interop issue we had uh, at that moment. Uh, actually, we identified this interop issue like 10 days before, and that is between extreme SLXs and Juniper MX10Ks. Uh, I will talk about it a little bit later. We placed RSVP policers to cut excess amount of RSVP messages between the nodes, uh, which can result in a slower convergence of the network, but that helped us to stabilize the network at that moment and makes things uh, easier. So we managed around 1 a.m. to conclude this uh, work. So Thursday morning, as we started investigating what happened the previous afternoon, uh, we started around office times, around nine o'clock. Uh, we started working, the whole team. Uh, we started fine-tuning the RSVP li uh, rate limiters. And uh, by 9.38, we noticed that uh, the issue came back. Uh, okay, and then we started rolling back every, all the changes we did. But this didn't help at all. The network was still very unstable. Uh, at 10.22, in a desperate action, we isolated the Juniper core router. But of course, the issue didn't wasn't fixed. We again, we didn't have clear visibility what was the real root cause. And then, at 10:52, uh, a colleague of mine noticed that okay, the suspicious customer of yesterday was connected again in the network. So he disconnected the guy, and immediately the network started getting stabilized, becoming more calm, and the issue actually almost gone. And then that, that created a lot of rings, a lot of bells. And what, what, what's happening here? So we started analyzing, and I'm going to present you, of course, a brief of what we saw. So this suspicious customer who was uh, connected uh, to one of our uh, Juniper machines, uh, he was sending us LACP packets, but in our case, we didn't configure the port as a, an aggregation port. Uh, that was not clearly communicated between M6 NOC and the customer that he wants to send us, a, he wants to establish a bundle with us. So he had, however, LACP in his side. So he started selling us LACP packets. And of course, since we didn't configure LACP on our side, as a, or probably you know, LACP packets have a multicast uh, destination MAC. Uh, the machine was receiving the packets and, okay, multicast address. I don't have LACP. Here you are. I'm sending this to the network. Then the LACP packets were flooding to the rest of the network and uh, reaching all the other P routers across. Of course, this is a, a simplification of the whole network uh, in this uh, picture. Then uh, you might say, okay, you guys should have some protection. So that's true. We do have protections. We do have a, a MAC ACL in the outgoing direction towards the customers. And especially for all the customers that have LACP, we have a, a MAC access list that's called out LACP, actually protects uh, the customers from these kinds of situations. Uh, they, they should not get uh, leaked LACP frames from the network. Unfortunately, this uh, MAC ACL didn't work. And the LACP packets that were coming from the suspicious customer leaked into other customers who had LACP protocol enabled. As a result, because the system ID and all the parameters of the LACP didn't match, the customers, the normal customers uh, who had uh, LACP aggregations, the, the connection started flopping. The, the LACP was resetting again and again. Means that the customers uh, were connecting and disconnecting from the VPLS network. Uh, especially those who have a lot of uh, private interconnects and other uh, services, we, which actually resulted in a huge RSVP storm towards the core, and then it was triggering the interop uh, bug that I'm going to explain to you now. So, uh, as I mentioned, we had already an interop bug for the last 10 days, but it was under control until that moment where uh, the case happened. So, the interop bug that we have is that for example, when you have a, a simple MPLS network, so this is a diagram, very simple just for you to understand. Uh, when you have a core that's a normal, a normal MPLS router, and let's say it's a couple of P's, and one, one of your P's gets disconnected for X, Y, Z reason, doesn't matter. Then what happens is that the P's try to reestablish the LSPs towards the missing uh, PE router. In that case, let's say the P12. 
uh, the P router needs to follow the strict paths that we configure for every uh, MPLS node in our network. So we don't have dynamic uh, LSPs, but we have LSPs based on RSVPT. So the paths are very strict. So the P router, the core router, needs to follow those strict paths and uh, tries to provision the, the session with a missing node. However, the missing node is missing. And in that case, the, the P router sends to the other uh, nodes a uh, path error message where the path state remote flag has been set. And of course, uh, all the other P routers get a packet. Uh, the same as the P11 router gets a packet, the path error message, uh, it removes the state. However, it doesn't respect the retry timer, which is 30 seconds. In a couple of milliseconds later, it creates a new state uh, for that particular uh, remote uh, node and tries again to provision the, the LSP. The P, the P router gets the message, sends again the, P, the path state removed, and it goes again and again in an endless loop that creates an RSVP storm. The same happened, however, uh, we also noticed a uh, similar behavior, again, based on this interop issue, where, for example, if you have an uh, unstable OSPF uh, network, and then uh, some of the remote uh, PE routers are learned via, let's say, the P21, then the P21 uh, sends a message, a path error message to the core router that says, okay, you try to provision LSPs through me, but I'm not a core router, I'm an edge router, I'm a PE router. So it sends back to the core and uh, again, a path error message, however, with different, uh, with different error, uh, it was the wrong destination lookback error in that case. And then the P, uh, the P router, send it back to the p11 the p11 uh, receives the messages removes the state creates new state immediately because it doesn't respect the retry timer and then it creates again the rsvp storm so um, we, we notice both behaviors so in short what happened on uh, that particular outage uh, as i mentioned we had lcp packets leaked into the platform and um, the LSCP packets, uh, the LSCP PDUs belong in a category of protocols that we call slow protocols. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the IEEE 802.3 standard describes about how you handle the slow protocols. Uh, we believe that those packets uh, shall be dropped uh, in the port of the router if you don't have LSCP enabled, of course. So it, the, the router shall ignore, shall ignore those packets. Uh, unless you explicitly allow them to go via uh, your network to reach a remote peer because of a business case or something. Uh, so far in our history, we never had such an issue with LSCP packets uh, leaking. Uh, we noticed that uh, the other machines that we used in the past, if they don't have LSCP configured, they immediately ignore the packets. Uh, of course, that was not enough. As I said, with the out LSCP MAC access list didn't work as expected uh, in the SLX OS wherever was created this access list didn't work, work as expected. We had something similar on Junos and in the local PE router that had the issue, it didn't work, but that was partially our fault because we didn't pay much attention to, to, to configure it strictly. Uh, it was a little bit loose on our side. And of course, all that stuff, we, on top of that, we had the interop issue that magnified uh, the whole situation and created uh, the chaos. Uh, once we understand the situation and the problem, of course, uh, we managed to take imme immediate measurements uh, on that. Of course, we updated all the Junos Fargol filters uh, for non LACP enabled customers uh, to drop such uh, packets. Uh, we immediately updated the M6 provisioning system. So, if there is a future port coming or connecting to the network, uh, these changes should be implemented over there, should be there, and those packets should be dropped. Um, what else? Uh, we also, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna work, uh, we started working on some uh, filters uh, that can drop the such slow protocols uh, that come from the pseudo wires, or um, actually not, not only LACP, but also STP and other protocols. So those things should be dropped and that filter will be applied in the VPLS uh, instance. Uh, but this feature exists only on the Junos. It's a great feature. We don't have it, however, in the previous generation uh, of machines. And of course, we're working with both vendors to provide them all the data they required, they, they're needed in order to solve the case in a more permanent access. Uh, if it is a bug, should be fixed and everybody should be happy that this bug uh, 
will not exist in the future versions. And before I thank the people over here uh, for attending my talk, I would like to take 20 seconds from your time because um, I want to say kudos to the whole NOC team for doing that. Uh, we had people leaving the dinner table, uh, stop feeding the kids, coming to the Zoom call, start working on the case. It was amazing uh, teamwork. It was very good to see everybody in the call. Also, I'm going to say thank you to people that made this meeting different for me. Um, as I said to my team on Friday, I'm going to do the walk of shame today on Monday morning when I go to the RIVE meeting because of this incident. This didn't happen, however. I will still remember Flavi on Monday morning give me, giving me a hug as a father to son because of that. Uh, Alexander Azimov for making me <laughs> Alexander Azimov was telling me stories from his uh, past experience trying me to make me happy you know that this shit happens to everybody Wolfgang from Degix he says go 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 do the presentation don't think about it it's it's your story it shit happens to everybody he was motivating me he was making me feel you know He's right, he's right. And at the end, yeah. Okay, shit happens, but you know, we are a community here. Everybody of you made me feel better. And I want to thank every and each of you that made this right meeting special. Thank you. Yeah, we have lots of questions. Wolfgang from, Wolfgang from Big Hicks, uh, also working in the IXP industry. Thank you for this talk. Thank you for being so open. Also, thank you for the communication during the incident and lots of sympathy. I've been in your place 10 years ago when we had a big problem. Thank you. Uh, Gerd Döring, not an IXP operator, just a network operator with lots of diverse gear in our network, migrating from this vendor to that other vendor, and then having three different core vendors trying to talk <laughs> to each other. And, yeah. oh, why do we have a BGP loop here all of a sudden? So, yes, uh, shit like that happens. Thank you very much for bringing forward what happened and explaining it so others can avoid doing the same mishap or if the similar situations happen they can remember oh shit it might be uh, lacp yeah. amzix had that issue let's look there so this really helps and it's not something to be ashamed of yeah. your team did a tremendous tremendously good work in finding the cause fixing it documenting it so that's something to be proud of yeah thank you you're right <laughs> Hi, uh, Son of Stefan, Six Connect. Yeah, stuff always go, uh, goes wrong, mistakes are made, and it's not about what goes wrong, it's about how you fix it. So job job well done, uh, like Gerd said, presenting it here will help the rest of the community. And I, I really like uh, the uh, how serious MZIX uh, took it. Like I saw that even the CTO flew out last minute to, yes. to attend here. Yes. Um, you set a great example. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sander. So there are, <clears throat> sorry, there are no comments online, but I would also like to just comment like, well done uh, on your side. Uh, your team has obviously made a a, um, a good effort and, and have, has managed to do this. And I'm very happy that you are talking about this because in my eyes, it also shows a lot of professionalism uh, if you can own up to your mistakes and say like, okay, this is how we handled it. This is what we could have made better and this worked fine. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Doris. Hi, Stavros, this is Marian. Uh, I just wanted to say everything has been said already, but uh, you have my sympathy. And thank you for sharing uh, the incident report because that's the most important thing uh, so we can learn from it as a community and make the internet more stable. Thank you. Thank you, Marian, you're right. Yeah, I just want to add that, yeah, it's actually a great you have a transparency commitment to the community and you actually are addressing that 
publicly coming here and disclosing what you just presented. Hats off for that. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, thank you, Stravo. Thank you very much. I hope you have a nice weekend. Okay, well, the last presentation was about one single incident. Emily will be presenting on other incidents and how is the picture from right at last. So, Emily is going to present remotely. Emil? Yes, hello. I hope you can hear me. Can somebody can please confirm? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yes, my name is Emil. I'm a data scientist at the Ripe NCC, and uh, we looked into uh, this outage. Um, and on one hand, uh, when such an outage happens, it actually makes me feel pretty bad uh, because you know that's like uh, maybe 20 kilometers from where I'm where, where I sit. There's a team in in uh, calls just like Stavros described. And I, I want to also add uh, to the um, uh, to the people who who, who commended uh, Stavros and Amzix for uh, being so open about this. Um, and as a researcher, I feel a bit like a vulture um, looking at um, uh, such events, but because they're they're so rare, um, um, they are also really interesting because uh, something like this doesn't happen uh, very often, and it helps us shed some light on the on the question uh, of um, does the internet route around damage. Um, um, and but we did a couple of earlier case studies uh, around uh, the, the the very large uh, IXs, uh, Amzix in, in 2015, and DKIX in uh, 2018, Lynx in 2021. And I was actually two weeks ago. I was half jokingly saying to my to my colleague Kasim, uh, "We are up for a large one in 2024." Um, and unfortunately, it happened a little bit earlier. Um, uh, but um, yeah, what we can actually do with uh, systems like Ripe Atlas is um, see what an uh, event like that looks like from the outside. And uh, I'd like to compare that a little bit to like uh, other fields of, uh, of, of research, chemistry and, 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 and uh, physics, where they just shoot lasers through things they want to look at. And um, well, we don't have laser beams. Well, uh, uh, we have lasers through fiber. Uh, but if you compare that to what we can do with Atlas, you could see Atlas as uh, the Atlas probes as sources of, of lasers and where you point them are the destinations and the, the beams themselves are trace routes. And if you just make them go through uh, your, your infrastructure, uh, and in this case it was M6, but it could be also a large network or uh, another IX, um, uh, you can actually see how that behaves. So if we calibrate uh, Ripe Atlas and only uh, take source destination pairs that reliably go through an IX and that reach a destination, so you have like end-to-end -end connectivity, and we, we basically take that for a single day and we apply that to, to AMZIX, we see in the order of uh, 66,000 pairs of uh, source destination pairs. It's around 7,000 probes. Uh, 1100 destinations and what you then see uh, if you then just look at these uh, these pairs of source destinations over time uh, around when an event happened um, this this is what you can see and I'll, I'll explain the picture um, what we see here is in uh, dark blue there are the source destination pairs that uh, have end-to-end Reach, uh, uh, reachability, so uh, we get um, responses uh, in trace routes from the destinations, and we we see the infrastructure that we studied, or in this case, AMZIX. So as you can see, before the event, that was on uh, everything was basically um, uh, following this pattern, and then when the event happened, uh, yes, there's uh, the, where the first one we actually see a drop, and uh, we don't see. Uh, or roughly half of the source destination pairs saw uh, MZIX, and the other half still had end-to-end -end connectivity. So 
uh, in as far as we can see, uh, there was routing around damage. Um, if there was a failure um, in end-to-end, -end, you would have more red there. At the, at the top of this graph, we actually see the, um, uh, a little bit of red, which, which, which indicates that we didn't have end-to-end -end connectivity anymore. And you can actually see that the, the two uh, uh, distinct events that uh, Stavros described, and you can see a slow shift back. And that shift back, um, um, well, it's pro uh, either a probably a combination of people manually configuring, reconfiguring, uh, as well as the BGP selection process, where at the, at the somewhere low down in the selection process, you have oldest route wins over newest route. And after an outage, your the new route via an exchange is typically not the oldest. So we can also look at the alternatives uh, that we see. Um, so the picture here on the right shows uh, it's the same uh, analysis methodology, um, but we then look at did we see other IXPs in the path? And we roughly see an even split if, if you uh, between the path without IXP, so that's the, the, the green line here in the middle. So that's transit or lateral, lateral peering. Uh, uh, we cannot really say from this. Um, and we see, uh, I, I plotted the three major IXPs. We, we saw a, a, a little bit of uh, other IXPs. Um, but what you see, here is uh, NLIX, D6, and uh, links taking over. And these, I would say, these are the expected alternatives uh, given the sizes and the localities of these, uh, these IXPs. Um, an interesting difference between the first and the second event is the huge uptick in uh, NLIX uh, here. Um, we can speculate that this was uh, manual reconfigs, uh, people setting uh, the preferences differently after the second time something happened. Um, okay, so if we look back at the other events that I, uh, I mentioned, um, you, you can basically see uh, mostly the internet routes around damage. It's the same same colors. We see a little bit more red here uh, than in the, the, the latest the, the event last week at Amzix. Um, and I, I, I don't know why that is. It's probably too, uh, uh, there's too little points in this study and it's probably a, a function of where we have Atlas probes uh, and, and uh, uh, who we are measuring. Uh, um, and uh, okay, I, I have to give credits to uh, Malte Tashiro at IIJ for recreating uh, these uh, independently. Um, and and oh, another interesting one here is the, the the differences in how fast things return to initial state. And again, this is like four case studies, so I don't think you can draw any conclusions uh, on that. Uh, but I find the, inter the differences interesting. Um, and a, 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 a bigger question, I think, is uh, can we do this around other IXPs? Because we see there is resilience around these very large IXPs. Um, can we also see resilience um, around uh, uh, other situations. Uh, hopefully these situations don't happen, uh, but when they happen, can you see the resilience? And this is a uh, prototype that we developed, uh, developed together with my colleague, Augustine, uh, where we look at how uh, close or how many, how much diversity around IXPs do we have uh, with RIPE Atlas? So if you, if you just uh, look at that from the, in, in terms of the number of ASs with probes within two milliseconds, you can actually see um, that we cover the bigger IXs uh, quite well. So I'm, I'm fairly confident with sort of like uh, um, how, how diverse the, the set is. Uh, but if you, there's a lot of IXs uh, uh, worldwide, like I, 
I think for this, we took peering DB and there's 648 lands uh, in there. Um, um, so there, there's some work to be done if you also wanna measure more IXPs here. So uh, takeaways, uh, well, the first one, as already mentioned, shit happens. Uh, this is all human made. Uh, and, it, and as Robbie said, it's not if, it's when. Uh, and in cases where we see outages at these large IXPs, we see the internet routes around damage. Uh, we might need more I, uh, atlas around IXPs, smaller IXPs, uh, to see similar things uh, in their local context. Um, and uh, this is a measurement study, it's not an answer study. We don't know why this is. I, I, I have a guess that it's like a rich local peering ecosystem around these large IXPs. Um, but it's an open question if it's the same for other locations. Um, and with that, um, I would like to open the floor for questions. Thanks a little. Any questions? Is anything in the queue? Uh, hello, uh, Peter Hessler from Global Ways. Um, I can add a little bit of a comment on why the uh, return to normal from the most recent AM6 outage, why it took longer than possibly expected, is because. Uh, Thursday morning of the second incident was uh, U.S. Thanksgiving. The day after that is Black Friday, which is, as everyone knows, a major shopping event um, in the U.S. and around the world. And so I imagine any large networks that were based in the U.S. connected to AM6 decided to um, either disconnect or de-preference uh, the AM6 platform during the, the shopping event to minimize disruptions on uh, for either if they're they're providing uh, connectivity for the store vendors, for the eyeball networks, for people buying from the stores or any, anything related to that. Oh, thanks, Peter. I, I hadn't seen, uh, I hadn't thought of that. That's good insight, thank you. Yeah, and I, I think that could be also interesting to look at other outages and response times and see if there's any sort of uh, major holidays or, or other events. Um, and it could also be things like um, like a sporting event where they don't want to disrupt connectivity during a Super Bowl or a World Cup or things of that nature. Cool. Thanks, Emil, for the wonderful presentation. And that will actually bring an end to this uh, plenary session. So we can go for a coffee break and return for the closing session. But before you go to the coffee break, I would request you again to please rate the presentations. And thank you, everyone, for being here. <laughs> Taurus, do you like to add anything? Would you like to add anything to it? Would you like to add anything? No. Nope. Nothing to add. Thank you. I didn't know that. Good afternoon. Before you leave the room, please, uh, especially if you are interested in the results of the general meeting, so give me a few seconds of your attention because this is the second part of the general meeting and I have results for you. So there were two resolutions uh, that we voted on and I'll, let me show you the first one. So the resolution was the general meeting approves the redistribution of the excess contribution slash deficit pay in 2023 by redistributing the ripe NCC 2023 surplus slash deficit to the membership in 2024. And it seems to be that majority of you believes that there will be a surplus and they want their money back. So you are gamers, guys. We warned you, but you, you voted and Vox Populi Vox Day, of course. So uh, the contribution or the deficit will be redistributed to the members in the next invoices. 
So resolution is approved. Uh, there was also the amendment of the articles of the association. Let me read it. The general meeting in accordance with article 21 of the articles of association adopts the amendments to the articles of association as proposed and announced by the executive board on 1st November 2023. Furthermore, the general meeting instructs and authorizes the executive board to perform or to have performed all that is required to have the amendment executed before a Dutch civil law notary. And um, I apologize, not just big exchange has some small glitches, also we made some small mistake uh, in the text. Uh, uh, it was corrected by email that was sent later. So again, I apologize for that, but I guess all the changes were very thoroughly explained in the presentation and also in the background documents. So I believe it couldn't lead to any confusion. And the resolution was approved. So uh, the changes will be adopted. That's all from my side. The general meeting is closed now. Thank you very much. Thank you and see you in spring. And the secret
found the use weekly.
Check, 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 Daniels. Check. Check, check and wings. Wait some more. Check.
Hello. Good morning to you all. And welcome to the closing plenary session of RIPE, some number, 87, what is even time? Um, so I'm Brian, uh, myself and Max will be chairing this session until we hand it all back to Miriam to safely bring it home. Um, first off, just before we have our first talk, I just want to announce the results of the PC elections. Um, thank you to all of you who participated. Special thanks to all the people who put themselves forward uh, for the role, and we hope that those of you who weren't successful on this particular occasion will put yourselves forward again at a later point in time. Um, so the two people who were successful uh, are Francisca Lichtblau and Valerie Aurora. So thank you very much. Um, and I know this will be said again, but I just want to say thank you very much, especially to Dimitro and Alexander, um, who this terms end at this meeting. So thank you very much for all the work they have done. So without further ado, um, I will introduce Daniel Wagner from DKIX uh, to talk about how to operate a telescope without operating a telescope. This is the Zen talk for the morning. <laughs> so there's this clicker thingy. Is that working? Awesome. All right. So hello, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to open this closing session. So this is sort of the beginning of the end. Um, my name is Daniel Wagner. I'm um, a researcher at DKIX, and I'm going to present you the, I would say, the most recent research work that we did at RIXP joint work together with colleagues from Georgia Tech, um, TU Delft, and Merit Networks. It's titled How to Operate a Telescope Without Operating a Telescope. Sounds a bit weird, but it's actually doable. And I will show you how. So first start off with what actually is an internet telescope. Well, basically, it is a chunk of IP address space that is announced to the public internet via BGP. So it's reachable to the public internet. And then what's special about it is that you do not do anything with that. So you announce your IP address space and you, does, you don't host any services in it. So we consider it to be dark. And if you do that, you would not expect to see any packets, right? So nobody should contact you because you're not hosting anything. So there is no purpose in contacting your network, but actually packets do come in. And this kind of traffic we refer to as the internet background radiation. So this could be caused, but this has three different causes that we're going to dive into. But for example, there could be scans on the internet. So people looking for services or looking for hosts, maybe some abandoned systems that do operate um, exploitable um, protocols, but uh, some malicious people could use for their actions. So for example, we've got the scanner here. So this is this weirdo, weirdo guy down there, and he's just scanning the whole slash zero. So basically every, um, address on the internet and on the IP version 4 address space to be exact in this uh, study. And so they will eventually contact your telescope network. What you do with the telescope network basically is you run TCP dump behind that and you just capture anything that's coming in. This is an analogy. So the reason why we call this a telescope, the analogy is that if you have a real telescope, those things that you can use to look into the, uh, into the sky, if you point them to a dark space in the sky where there are no stars, you would not expect to see anything, but still you see the cosmic background radiation. So this is why we call those kind of networks the internet telescopes. So what can we do with that? So why is this actually a thing? Well, this has some security use cases. So uh, network internet security um, does need to know, sorry, want to have some kind of intelligence about who is scanning. So what networks are operating such uh, scans um, to the side. This is sometimes an educational network, some students performing some tests, but could also be malicious people. What ports are being scanned? So by ports, I mean the transport protocol port. So that is somebody looking for, let's say, a talent port, port 23. Uh, we'll see those kind of very prominent uh, parts later on. How many scanners are there? Yeah, um, and who are they actually? So where are they, what network and what kind of entity is behind that, could be behind this. The thing where this is interesting is that usually malicious people do spoof their source addresses to carry out attacks, but when a malicious uh, actor needs to know 
um, where the vulnerable systems are, they need to get the response. So they rather not spoof their Swiss address because they just need the response back. All of this helps to gain insights and will lead to uh, insights into your attack vectors. So what is currently being prominently used on the web? So what, what new services are coming up that, um, for example, can be used for launching DDoS attacks? And in the end, if you have this kind of uh, knowledge, you could uh, prevent such attacks. All right. So now the um, kind of idea that we had, this overall scheme, is you know there are these three sources, namely the misconfigurations could be misconfigurations like for example DNS services misconfigured, they are pointing to a wrong IP address which happens to be in your telescope, so you will get some resolvers trying to contact you. Just as an example, you've got all kinds of scanners out there, and you have attack backscatter, which is a third thing, but I won't go into detail on this. So the idea here is that we, as an IXP operator, if we leverage our vantage point in the internet, which is somewhere there. <laughs> Um, we will see those kind of scanning activity going through the internet to basically all networks on the internet. So these kind of networks could be the ones that are actually operational telescopes, and we collaborated with them. You'll see after. And this is the rest of the internet also. And what this figure does not show too nicely is that it also terminates inside these in, in the, inside the internet backbone. So since we, are, we see the traffic that is going towards the telescopes and to all the other networks, um, we could derive certain characteristics from what the telescopes as a ground truth source do see, and then infer where there are more of those networks that do see the exact same kind of traffic patterns. Was it, is it moving? Got to push it hard. All right. So as said, we were collaborating with three operational telescopes, and we were using or made basically inferring the kind of traffic characteristics that telescopes usually do see. And with this, we develop a methodology that can be applied to any network in the forwarding backbone of the internet. In our case, it was IXPs, but could also be ISPs, um, to derive more address space on the internet that is not a telescope or not necessarily. And those prefixes or in subnets that we could infer scanning traffic for, we refer to as meta telescope prefixes. And then with that, we try to find as, as many of, uh, of, of these meta telescope prefixes as possible, which in the end gives us a huge set of prefixes for which we know they receive scanning uh, activity. And this effectively gives us a very large telescope without operating a telescope. Traditionally, or typically, if you operate a, tel a telescope, you have one prefix. Um, the bigger the prefix is, the more scanning traffic you will see, the more insights you might get. But still, one prefix is located in, well, hang on, first thing, sorry. First thing is, if a uh, scanner knows about your telescope prefix, they can just block list this prefix so that they will no longer scan it, meaning that the attacker knows or the malicious uh, actor knows that a uh, telescope can no longer infer what I am scanning. So I basically make them blind to what's what I'm interested in, and they can't get back the knowledge to prevent my attacks. So once your prefix is being block listed, your telescope is pretty much useless. So this is also why those prefixes are being kept secret. So if you have one prefix, it belongs to one AS. And sometimes scanners are interested in scanning data center networks rather than educational networks, for example. If your telescope is located in an educational network, for most universities that we collaborated with, this is true, they do not see the kind of scanning activity that's going towards data centers. So now as we have got lots and lots of these meta telescope prefixes, well, they are in basically every type of network. And lastly, some networks um, that, that are located in a specific country are being scanned more than others or differently than others. Meaning that if you have one telescope that is, say, in the Netherlands, you will see likely Netherlands scanning traffic, but not the scanning traffic of, let's say, China. Once again, in our case, we can infer scanning traffic that goes to Chinese networks. So, well, you'll see the map afterwards, the whole, whole world, meaning that we have no such uh, constraints. And this is what, why this is actually a cool thing in the academia. All right, so first of all, we need to get the characteristics from the traffic. So we were collaborating, as I said, with three telescopes. Um, two of them are in Europe in different countries. We refer to them as TEU1 and TEU2. And there is another one in the US. 
those packet uh, those those telescopes as said operate tcp dumps so we get the full packet captures so it gives us lots of insights um yeah but those three different uh, telescopes have different prefix sizes so they're quite mixed it was also interesting gave us some insights and we were looking at a 24 hours period somewhere this is april first of all when we're investigating those pcaps we found the obvious one right so telescope does not host anything so it's not sending anything so we don't have any outbound traffic here but what's coming in it's more interesting and this is where we start with first of all we find that most of the traffic namely depending on the telescope it was about 90 percent of any incoming packet to be an empty tcp soon so these are scanners that are trying to establish a connection on a certain port trying to figure out what service could be running behind this um, port behind this ip address and those packets consist of a 20 bytes ip header and a 20 bytes tcp header but some of them have an option set, which spends another eight bytes to the packet size. Um, those options can be used for fast reopening and other things that attackers might be looking for. So this is why we did, because we didn't exactly know what packet size we should now use for our inference. And this is why we did a sensitivity analysis on the packet size. The details are in the paper. <laughs> and it turns out that the average is exactly in the middle between 40 and 48 bytes. So it's 44 bytes what we use for our threshold. Coincidence? I don't know. Next thing is that we were looking at the amount of packets that a telescope receives. Well, this depends on the size. As said, the larger telescope prefix is, the more packets you will be recording. Per 24, per slash 24, and per day, we found that this is 1.7 million packets on average. Well, given our three telescopes that we work with. And lastly, well, that's it. Okay, there's more coming after. All right. So now we have those characteristics of scanning traffic. And we do now apply this to our IXP data set. Um, we have 14 IXPs in our study. They are spread across Europe, North America, and one is in Asia. Diverse MEM accounts, diverse peak traffic volumes. Um, we were looking and we were having a sample low data um, data set of the same time. So it's once again, a 24 hours somewhere this April. So Here's a pipeline that we basically had. So on the left, you will see those characteristics. Once again, we added a few filters more to narrow down this flow data to actually find the meta telescope prefixes. We first of all, we're looking at TCP only. Unfortunately, we could not ch check for the TCP flags, which would help us to just find the TCP sins, but we knew that 90% of all is TCP sins, so that was okay to neglect. Then we have got our magic byte threshold we're not looking for any outbound traffic and we were further filtering out reserved ip address spaces or private ip address space because they can't be a telescope right we also require the telescope to be globally routed as said you have to announce your prefix if it's not announced it can't be a telescope and lastly we're applying our uh, packet count threshold so if you look to the right i've got this figure here so we started off with some 6 million slash 24 subnets in the ixp data set and by successively applying the filters, we were down to about 370,000 meta telescope prefixes. We found some 800 something K more slash 24 nets that violated any of those filters. And if they violated the no outbound filter, well, then it's a gray net. Yeah? Gray net means that some parts, portions of the network appear to be active and other and part of the slash 24 appears to be dark. So we say it's a gray net. However, we were looking for those slash 24s, the real darknets. So these are the darknets for, for which every data point we had qualified as exactly scanning traffic, right? So mind those 380K that we just saw, because it's now down to 318K. And this is because so far we have just been seeing what we are measuring, but we can't really tell whether we're just measuring scanning traffic or whether the, the prefix that we're looking at is actually inactive. So we were using external data sources, namely census, NDT, and ISI to further eliminate networks that those external data sources told us that they, these blocks are actually being active. So we consider those ones we had before to, to contain false positives. And this is the one we can say that the external data sources confirmed that we are actually on the right track. So this table shows us um, the stats for all the individual sites, as, as said, we've got 49 IXPs. And if we combine all of them, we can find that there are fewer uh, meta telescope prefixes surviving our filtering um, compared to if I looked at um, certain sites individually. 
This means that the more knowledge of different IXPs we combine, the more precise we can get. And actually, the false positive rates here is higher than here. This is the lowest false positive rate we could have, about 11 point something percent. Details are in the paper. Further, we find that the largest IXP, which is CE1, finds meta telescope prefixes in over 200 countries. This is awesome. You know, this is like equivalent you would need to get. Um, 200 different prefixes in 200 different countries as a researcher, for example, or enthusiast or whoever. This is basically undoable. Um, and then we found that the second largest one um, finds meta telescope prefixes in the most different ASs, which is over 8,000, about 9,000 almost. All right, so, so far we have scanning traffic inferred. All right, cool. So, but is this actually correct? And to somehow get an idea of how precise our work has been so far, we were looking at the address space of a telescope that we collaborate with. So this is ground truth. And we're figuring out how many of those blocks we could identify are actually located inside the prefix that we know is a telescope. And this is how it looks like. This is a Hilbert curve. So Hilbert curve showing um, colorized blocks for the ones we inferred. These are slash 24 subnets. The white ones we don't have any data point for, or they are active or disqualified, so we couldn't make a claim or we claim that it's not a telescope block. And we find that it's, the ones we inferred are clearly inside the boundary. And while I was browsing through this um, Hilbert curve, like I had the whole IP version 4 address space. I will show you more insights of this uh, on the next slide you could clearly see those kind of patterns. So like, this looks like a big fog, which is telling me, then you'll look at this, there is a block or a larger region that contains only inactive addresses. And then I mapped the boundaries of our telescope on top and I saw like, okay, looks good. And there are some blocks inferred to be dark, namely five outside the boundaries, which is okay because not all blocks on the internet need to be, uh, need to be dark, right? Need to be active, sorry. So they are dark actually, or could be dark. So as said, we have got two more blocks that were quite catching my eyes. Um, for example, we have a, another known telescope, which is pretty huge, um, but we didn't collaborate with. And I'll tell you that these three big blocks, <laughs> blocks are the boundaries of the telescope. So I could have also have drawn this that way. So. And then there appears to be another block, but we don't know what's going on there. And then we found a very large chunk of unused IP address space somewhere in the internet. So those kinds of patterns, they, they're like really popping my eyes. Well, all right, so let's see where they actually are located. So we used um, Maximine Geolite 2 to map those prefixes to country codes. And then with this, we generated this kind of heat map, world map, I'd say. So the findings here, from our data set is that most of the, these meta telescope prefixes are located in the US. Then to our data set, uh, the second most populated meta telescope prefix country, I would say, appears to be China. This could be because we do not really see the traffic for Chinese networks, but it could also be that they are not active to the outside or they are just unused. So different reasons here possible causes. We also find that Africa tends to have the fewest meta telescope prefixes. So this could also be due to limitation of our visibility of the traffic. So we could not tell anything. Or this could also be that they just have to use what IP addresses they have. So next up, we were comparing those ports. Like this is the applications that are being scanned for. On the left, on the left table, you can see what we got from the PCAPs, from the ground truth, from our telescopes we collaborated with. And on the right, you've got the table for what we inferred with our methodology. Overall, we find that, as said, the port 23, Telnet, SSH, port 22, and certain web services, AT and ATAT, are being most prominently scanned. So in green, I underlined what is the overlap. So we find that we are okay, decently somewhere close to what the ground truth is saying. And what is more interesting is that one of the telescopes that we collaborated with was configured on the ingress router to drop any incoming packets on port 23, which is Telnet and port 445 for security reasons. Well, we don't have such filters. We do just observe what the internet's telling us. 
and we find those ports, namely port 23, to be apparently, apparently in our data set, the most prominent port. So we could now go ahead, call TEU1. Hey guys, um, I know that you're going to be scanned on port 23 very heavily. And they say, uh, nice. All right, let's move on. Then we did the same kind of analysis for um, network types. So we were looking at what network types are being scanned in what fashion on what ports most prominently. So first off, ISP networks, they pretty much dominated where we found the meta telescope prefixes to be located in. But still, we could find some things like data center networks are being scanned at port 80 or 8080 more than other ports inside the data center network and also compared to other networks. So this is why not at scale for scaling details I refer to the paper, but the takeaway is still visible here. This is something you could not have if you just had one uh, prefix located in a single network. And then once again, for a country or continent, we found, for example, which I just want to highlight here quickly, is that in Africa, for the day that we were scanning or analyzing, we found that in Africa, apparently there was a campaign going on on port 37215. I have no clue what the service is behind that port. Um, once again, such insights are not possible if you just have a, your prefix it and in, in the Netherlands or in Germany or what, wherever. All right. So... I should be summing up. In conclusion, we found that there are lots of slash 24 blocks inferable as so-called meter telescope prefixes around the globe in all network types. And as I said, the inference that we presented is basically um, applicable to any kind of network that is somewhere in the background uh, and in the backbone of the network, the internet, um, that is carrying IBR, internet background radiation. And with all of those insights, and whoever is interested in leveraging one of the, some of these, this helps to improve internet security research overall. So I think I've got a couple of minutes for discussion. I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions. And we didn't have any online uh, last time I checked. So I hope to have somewhat of a discussion here. <laughs> <laughs> so if I may, <laughs> I've got some backup slides. OK, sure. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. oh, no, it's starting. Perfect. You asked for it. Um, yes, I asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> I am Daniel Farnberg, one of the founders of the Wild Framework, founder and the system staff member, speaking for myself. Um, and of course, the whole thing was confused, I guess, but you know who I am. Um, <laughs> You were looking at packet traces at IXPs. Uh, you were looking at <laughs> packet traces from ISPs. X. Were there any privacy concerns? Yes, of course. How did you deal with them? Yes, so we did deal with them. So I, this is the third time I gave this talk. And this is the first time somebody raised that question. What? <laughs> and this is the third time that my boss told me watch out for that question. <laughs> all right, jokes, jokes aside. Um, so what we did is kind of, first of all, we were anonymizing the, the data on slash 24s. So we do not have any individual IP addresses. So we do not know what's the individual behind the IP address. Well, um, that being first of set. Then second thing is, this is kind of a somewhat a live analysis. So packets going in, going to be analyzed, and then afterwards discarded. So we do not have any of those traces anymore. Well, I've got some intermediate results and I've got the plots, right? Okay, but I don't have any of this data anymore. Then it's sample data, it's aggregated IP fix that's used for statistical reasons. And lastly, the type of traffic that we're inferring, the kind of the scanning traffic is something that the subject, whoever might be behind that block, didn't request. So this is just like garbage in his front door, and we are looking at it, maybe. You're, you're okay, not you satisfied. Asked, you asked for it again. I did. Uh, science is not science if it cannot be reproduced. So yes. If you throw away your raw data, yeah. basically this is worthless. No, it's not. It's not. Because you can apply all of those things to your own data set and see that it works. Trust me, bro, I double checked. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, do we have anything new online? No? Nope. Oh, okay. 
Uh, hello, Peter Hessler from Global Ways. Um, I see that this anal analysis is on IPv4. Uh, did you have a chance to do a similar analysis on IPv6? And I yes. would be especially interested to hear how they compare because IPv4, I expect, is, is densely utilized, whereas IPv6 is generally sparsely utilized. Right. Um, so for our analysis, we did not yet. I have to say not yet, but there are some. Where, where, where are you? There you are. Um, we do have certain plans to apply our analysis to IP version 6. Um, and we're very curious to see what's the outcome. So generally, we would have, or we had, we have to um, re tweak our parameters for the analysis. As you said, the scan activity is much lower, apparently. Um, so we need to adjust our packet threshold thingy to be more like on, on spot what the telescopes are actually saying, the ground truth is telling us. Um, as I said, we did not yet perform the kind of analysis, but we expect, well, rather not so interesting insights. Scan activity in version 6 works way different and is not used that much on the net. So what I think what we, what we um, have as a result is basically a very, very dark and boring large IP version 6 address space. My experience, uh, my, my expectation. Uh, yeah, I think that would be the, the current expectation, but I'm also curious if you could collect this data now and then again mm -hmm. in five years and again in 10 years, et cetera, and see how this changes over time. Um, so if we are legally allowed to store the data for that period, so this is kind of a, a process we have to go through. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, technically it's possible just to see a long-term evolution of the IP version address, uh, IP version 6 address based scanning activity. Theoretically possible. So if you, well, I have, I would have uh, to check with my, with my uh, colleagues if we can uh, get something like this arranged, but theoretically and technically it's possible. I, I, I'd assume, depending on the data volume that you have to store. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Cat. And then we close the, the queue. Got to ring. Um, this is interesting uh, mm -hmm. stuff that you bring. Um, Peter prompted me to to ask that question because he said densely populated, and what you seem to find is that there's large chunks of the IPv4 internet which are not populated. So maybe rumors mm -hmm. about IPv4 exhaustion, exhaustion, run out, run out, <laughs> are slightly exaggerated. So this is actually actually something that really wonders me how much of the v4 space is actually still sitting somewhere waiting for the ipv4 price to rise to 100 euros uh, per ip address or so maybe this is a question back to the community if we want this i don't know <laughs> but yeah i was i was um about to put this on the slide is basically a question is um is this wanted is this what we want is this like do are we aware of this is anybody aware of like that many blocks being inactive? They are um, allocated. They are yes. Please come come again. <laughs> Was this like yes? I am aware. Okay, so people are agreeing. Okay, so people yeah. Here we've got the number. Here's a, here's a rough number of uh, like what the situation appears to be. And then the question is, how should we deal with that? Should we somehow transfer them back? Make use of it? Well, it's up to you to, to discuss. First, I should get the data. All right, <laughs> if I'm allowed. <laughs> we have no more questions, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Menno for with the tech report from the from the conference. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the uh, technical report for uh, RIPE 87. Um, we have a group of, uh, oh, I'm going back. Um, so we have, uh, you've seen probably a group of techies uh, running around. Um, here's a picture of uh, uh, a selection of engineers uh, that have been helping setting up uh, the meeting. Um, <laughs> the meeting uh, starts on Monday, but we already uh, arrive on uh, first day, I did at least, and a couple of uh, my colleagues, uh, and we started setting up the network on Friday. Um, then also on Friday, uh, more colleagues arrived, and uh, together we uh, started uh, setting up uh, the network. We set up the presentation system you see there and uh, all the Wi-Fi access points, 
um, already in the weekend the network was uh, used by uh, uh, for certain uh, several board meetings that happened so it was important for us to get everything up and running um, as soon as possible after we arrived um, this is a list of things that we bring um, to make this uh, meeting work i'll show you some pictures later of the equipment uh, some of the equipment but first let's have a look at the uh, network uh, that we had running here this week this is the uh, topology um, you see uh, that the cold is our uh, uplink provider they provided us a 10 gig uh, link where we got a full table from um, you see also uh, here how we've uh, set this up uh, the slides are online you can download them if you want to have a closer look. Um, here is the phys physical network topology. Um, we have the cold top link, we have a, a Juniper switch uh, to which we've connected um, all of the other uh, um, switches and little switches you might have seen lying around in the rooms. These are all those switches, um, a lot of uh, yeah, cascading. This was had to do with the uh, hotel um, infrastructure. There were some challenges here. <laughs> there were many broken uh, sockets. And uh, one very annoying thing was that um, they've painted the walls, including the sockets. So we couldn't read uh, what number was on, on the socket. Here you see uh, me testing uh, with a colleague on another end. Um, to see uh, yeah, if we could figure out what port was uh, going where. But apart from yeah, ports not being labeled properly, many of them were just broken. So fortunately, though, there were some usable ports, and uh, we made use of those. And that's why you see those X, um, switches on the wall. So there we would then connect all of our access points to. Um, there is also uh, missing documentation but also there was a lot of documentation in the patch rooms that was outdated. So we looked at it, but it was pretty useless. Um, and then uh, the tripping circuit breakers, you might've noticed on Tuesday that we had power issues. Um, the hotel couldn't tell us why, but um, yeah, looking at <laughs> this uh, spaghetti, um, we might have an idea. Um, also, they made it very difficult for us to reach our equipment when they um, put all the cleaning uh, stuff in front of the patch cabinet. Um, but yeah, we, we managed. Uh, we had to make some of our own cables, which is a very dangerous task. somebody from the hotel to hear this talk because that's important <laughs> for them. We'll but send well, not, not that much for us, but for them uh, to fix their stuff. We'll send them uh, a video uh, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, you see here, um, uh, yeah, how dangerous it is to be uh, an engineer at, uh, at the right meeting, but you know, somebody has to do it. And um, the cable that you see here is going to the uh, bar uh, area. Um, some of you uh, rightfully so mentioned that there was no coverage there in the beginning of the week. So we uh, we went there and, and made sure it happened. Uh, there were no patches in that area. So we uh, had to run a, a, a cable that was over 100 meters. So we put a switch in between and eventually uh, got it to work. Um, this is... <laughs> This is not us. This is the the hotel um, doing investigations on on the power outages. But I don't know if they are the cause of them or if we don't know. Um, here you see uh, the the circuits that yeah uh, we took pictures of um, so that we knew at least what things look like when everything is working. <laughs> So we could fix problems ourselves and we didn't have to ask the, uh, the hotel for help. 
Um, this is a map of the uh, access points um, that we, uh, we, we, we installed throughout uh, the, the hotel. Um, yeah, as you can see, the number three and four, that is the breakfast area here and uh, also part of lunch. We didn't cover that, but the other uh, lunch area was covered. And yeah, you could see a lot of people make use of that there as well, because there wa wasn't much um, space to sit for people uh, elsewhere. And uh, yeah, the, the coffee break areas, they, they were quite um, small here downstairs. There were no tables, etc. But I think everyone managed to find the working internet because also, I don't know if it, how it was in your rooms, but my room had no internet, and some people had a little bit of internet. Um, here is the Wi-Fi uh, network graphs. Um, compared to the previous ride meeting, you see that there is a drop um, in the, the dual sec uh, network uh, usage um, and an increase uh, in IPv6 only. But what is also interesting is that there is an increase in 2.4 gigahertz usage. Um, not sure entirely why that is. Also, um, we made a change. So the IPv6 only network is now a pure IPv6 only network. There is no uh, NOT64 uh, anymore that has been replaced with this. Um, so if you want to experience how it is to be on an IPv6 only network, and no uh, trickery to uh, to get IPv4 uh, uh, content uh, working. Then yeah, join this. And uh, yeah, as mentioned here, surprisingly uh, usable. Uh, but there are still websites out there with uh, only uh, uh, IPv4 uh, DNS record. And GitHub is an example, and Twitter as well. Um, so about the uh, legacy network that we have, it's uh, the um, uh, dual stack network. Um, and that's the only one that had 2.4 gigahertz. We were wondering why people were joining that uh, as some of them uh, joined with uh, 5 gigahertz devices. Uh, and we, we, we think that they should perfectly well uh, be capable to work on the right MTG uh, network, like the main network. But for some reason, people joined the legacy network. I don't. We don't understand why, but yeah, uh, they might have had a, a random issue uh, and they fixed it by uh, joining the legacy network. We would like to know uh, why, uh, if you have any any reason, maybe it's something we can uh, can work on fixing, or at least it's nice to understand why people join the uh, legacy network. Then, uh, yeah, it's time for a new um, uh, acronym. Um, we have many in uh, in this community the DDR. Um, what does this mean? <laughs> Deutsche Demokratische Republik? No, not in this case. Dance Dance Revolution? <laughs> also not. Double data rate? The DDR memory? No. It means discovery of designated resolvers. Um, there's an RFC uh, for you to read on your uh, flight back if you're uh, bored. Download it before boarding. Um, and uh, so this uh, discovery of designated resolvers, it helps clients to, um, to, to, to get the information for uh, encrypted DNS so that they can do uh, DNS over HTTPS or DNS over TLS. Um, and this is something that Windows and uh, macOS support. Um, and uh, something that we also wanted to offer here. But it requires a TLS certificate. Um, so we went uh, went out there to get this certificate. But we need uh, an, an SAN uh, um, entry with the IPv6 uh, address. And uh, so uh, we wanted to do this with Let's Encrypt. But of course, they don't support uh, IP address uh, validation. Uh, or I mean, they don't support uh, an IP address uh, SAN. Um, so we went to DigiCert, which we uh, which quoted us $1,057 for a year, but we thought this is way too expensive. Um, so we went to the next uh, out there, Sectigo, and they um, offer a certificate for $149 per year. 
But when we tried to uh, get this uh, certificate, we got an error. Um, error minus one. So we contacted support and then support said, well, we kindly uh, request you to uh, go further with the order without adding IPv6 to the sun. So, okay, thank you, but we'll uh, shop somewhere else. Um, then we uh, got to SSL.com, 177 euros per year, uh, dollars. And um, they uh, support uh, IPv6, but uh, IPv4 now was uh, causing troubles. You see that we added uh, the, those three records, NS cache and the V6 addresses. And when adding the IPv4 address, we got an error and we couldn't proceed uh, adding it to our card. But after contacting support, they told us of uh, another way we could do it. So we managed to, uh, to eventually get this uh, certificate and um, we installed it and started to make use of it. And uh, we saw in the meeting an increase of uh, DNS over HTTPS, uh, which was uh, good, but we also saw some issues. Uh, Mac uh, users could have seen this when they browsed to GitHub, uh, DuckDuckGo, maybe some other websites too. And uh, it was a bit weird because it says, because it was blocked by RightMTG. Well, we're not blocking anything on purpose. Um, so let's, uh, we, we went to have a look, closer look at this. Um, what we did uh, were some tests and some of you helped out as well uh, by changing settings in uh, macOS, but some things worked uh, for a short while, but the problem often just came back and uh, you got the error back again that Safari couldn't open. Um, so we turned off uh, DDR, um, and uh, as you can see, uh, it dropped, and in, uh, the DNS request, uh, uh, the regular DNS request uh, grew again, um, and that, sorry, that helped. Uh, it, the problem was solved, but we still don't know what's going on. Um, so if anyone has an idea, let us know. Um, otherwise, we'll try and uh, figure it out. But hopefully, the uh, next right meeting, uh, we know what's going on. Uh, and hopefully, there's a fix. Then, uh, this is a slide from previous right meeting as well. Uh, it's an explanation of our presentation system because some people uh, yeah, are interested in, in knowing how, this, how, how that works. The magic is happening over there. Um, we have uh, two Mac Minis uh, running there with an HDMI switcher. And um, when the presentation that's up now is there, we can prepare the next presentation uh, from there. And uh, with this switcher, we can seamlessly switch in between. Um, we don't have like uh, a lot of PDFs uh, in sequence ready uh, because some of you have live demos. Um, and there's also uh, people from Meet Echo that present uh, remote. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's this way we can support everything like that, live demos, etc. There's also a timer. Let me see, I have zero seconds uh, left, it says here. Um, that means that I need to uh, quickly go through uh, my following slides. Um, that is just some statistics. Uh, these are in the slide deck, so you can uh, have a look at them and we can also look back in previous years uh, to see um, what was happening. So here you see, uh, well, Colt gave us a 10 gig link. Uh, we're not near uh, anywhere near that, so that's good. Um, uh, so we don't have to ask for a 100 gig next time. Then uh, DHCP leases, um, these are lower than like before we had the, because now we have uh, IPv6 mostly network uh, and most people are on there, but um, these are V4 leases uh, from people. Um, the Wi-Fi clients, it's also a graph. Yeah, you see how busy it was and uh, you see the lunch breaks in here. Um, maybe, no, yeah, a little bit. You can see maybe the, the a certain buff at some point, but yeah, it's it's not that clear this time. So, um, here is uh, my last uh, uh, statistic and it's um, uh, people joining remote. Uh, 
on the Meet Echo uh, platform, you see uh, IPv6 uh, 63%, which is, uh, I think, well, okay, but it should be higher, uh, of course. I'm curious uh, in six months from now what we'll see at the next meeting. Uh, OS usage, browser usage, uh, might be interesting uh, statistic for some of you. And then thanks to uh, these teams as well, uh, web team, uh, the stenographers team, the Meet Echo team, and the conference coordinators. And with that, that's the end of uh, my presentation. Okay, wow. So I'm just going to close the line right now. Um, <laughs> was this a coordinated move? Anyway, uh, please. Get it, Barish. Um, I mean, uh, thanks for all the great work, uh, uh, even though there were some, uh, some challenges. Uh, as engineers, uh, we all know you need to bring uh, your own plasters. If not, calling in like 250 people from the Red Cross for the cleanup, <laughs> you know. Anyway, I would like to present you some plasters if you need them, because it's probably easier. Thank you. <laughs> I was looking at all the people coming in this morning going, did something happen that I wasn't aware of? <laughs> Is the Friday just particularly violent? Um, anyway, please. Okay, uh, Benedict Stockelbahn speaking for myself. The reason with the 2.4 uh, gigahertz uh, use might be, at least if I remember correctly, what I noticed was that there, at some point when I first uh, turned uh, uh, switched to the Wi-Fi, it was the only one I could reach, either because 2.4 has a better range, might be because the other stuff might be not. And once people set that up, they stick with it, yes. love cases. So that might be the reason for that. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, we have a do. question, um, which is not really a question, but a remark. Um, at least uh, one of the microphone cue cameras showed some video garbage for a couple of seconds each time video sharing in the Meet ecosystem started. Not sure if this can be resolved. So this is something for Meet Echo. I guess I'll take a note. Thank you. Thank you. You've been very bad at saying who we are and asking questions. So. Yeah, Robert Czech from ETHIS GmbH. Hi, um, Urban Sardoni. So I, I would like to confirm for the 2.4 uh, what the person uh, previously said, uh, but I want to say thank you so much for the IPv6 only network. I was the one that mentioned it in, in Rotterdam. I'm really happy it's here. Um, and now I, we can start making a list of apps that don't work on IPv6 only. So, but thank you so much for this experiment in, and I think it's making a change in, in understanding what works and what doesn't. Thank you. Thank you. And, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and actually, I'm, I'm just going to say that um, it's, it's not a terrible thing that Twitter isn't reachable on that <laughs> network. <laughs> um, just block it from all the other ones. That'll be next meeting. Cool. Uh, I saw you used uh, right, search you just, again who you are. Ah, uh, Maxim Tulif, net assist. I saw you used uh, search Raspberry PIs for what? Yeah, um, the Raspberry um, uh, PIs, uh, the Raspberry Pis are used for uh, the uh, televisions uh, that you see um, in this, uh, not in this room, but outside. Um, we we show some uh, slides or, or moving images, but we also use them. Um, in the ops in our ops room where the there are also stenographers there and they also uh, have two screens there with uh, raspberry pis connected to it that show what's going on uh, here so instead of having uh, a lot of uh, laptops or macbooks we use these uh, smaller devices for various uh, tasks uh, that we have yeah cool. no, nothing else online oh wait, right yes one last question Hello, Alaric. Uh, you said that who have Sorry, you? Again. Who are you, please? Alaric from uh, Gandhi. Uh, you said that you have a full view from Colt, but is only a link, so why not just the code? Sorry. Uh, you, you said that you have a, a full view from Colt. Yes. But as it's a, on, the, only a link, why don't you have just the default code? Um, ah. We have, uh, okay, we have a full table, yeah. So uh, this is uh, because we want to do uh, RPKI um, and uh, to do the RPKI filtering, we want to have the full table. Okay. Yeah. Fair point. Yeah. Cool, well, listen, th thank you again 
for all the work that all the teams have, have done. Thank you. I think this has probably been one of the most challenging environments that you've had in, in many, many years. So, you know, yay. Okay, so um, we now have a report from the Code of Conduct team. So, yay, Sebastian, you're here. Good. Uh, so, please. Unless Mano still did, I don't think Okay, welcome to the report of the Code of Conduct team. Um, we did have three reports submitted so far, two by email and one was reported um, in person. Um, one has been assessed as, and um, is uh, seen as being concluded. The other two are pending um, and in assessment. So. This is a transfer report, so you get an idea what happened during the during the meeting. Sorry. <clears throat> the one that's uh, concluded, um, the assessment group was formed. So th this is how we proceed. That reached out uh, to the subject uh, of the report and um, the party that the report was about. Um, the incident involved as a breach as a uh, in the ripe of uh, conduct team for the sorry of the uh, ripe code of conduct and uh, the two parties agreed to solve uh, that between themselves um, any further personal details will not be shared um, this stays within the code of conduct team and uh, obviously between the um, the two groups um and about the two others um these are still pending so we cannot add um, any more information here um how to report just um as a reminder how that works so if you do experience a behavior that makes you um and or others uh uncomfortable um please speak with us um you can uh, inform the whole team by the form. You find that on um, the link here. You can mail to the uh, Code of Conduct team. You can reach to us uh, in person by just going to one of the members, which are shown in the next slide. Um, and uh, you can email them. The template for that is uh, firstname.lastname at coc.ripe.net. And finally, that's uh, that's the team currently. Um, anyway, th there are some persons on, on that team, but we looking for more volunteers to have a brighter um, um, group of people that can uh, handle such reports and uh, deal with incidents if they are happen. So feel free to contact us um, if you want to know about more uh, about the process, how to join, please visit the website, the ripe.net um, slash coc. And that's it. Please. Hi, Harry Cross here. Just a question. Is there going to be a chance we can hear about the outcome of the two that are still being assessed? Because uh, I, just, I just think that would help to confirm the effectiveness of the code of conduct process more than anything else. Yes, we we will go on, proceed that, and um, we'll do um, a final report later. Thank you, because I, I really think these should be resolved by the end of the conference to ensure that there is sort of an um, outcome if possible. That, that if, if possible, obviously we try, but um, I don't think uh, that's in any case possible. Hi, uh, Sandal Stefan, Six Connect. Um, thanks a lot to the to the whole team because this is not an easy job. It's a lot of responsibility. Um, so first of all, th thank you for that. Um, and at some point in the future, I'm, I, I'm not putting you on the spot right now, but it would be uh, interesting uh, if there were uh, to see if there's is a trend up, down, or if it's just all different types of uh, uh, violations. Like, is there 
are there specific areas that we need to pay more attention to? Um, you have very few data points with only three complaints, so I, I guess it's kind of hard, but I will be interested to see uh, uh, if we as, as a community can do better in some ways. Uh, we obviously keep for a certain time some records. Um, I'm not sure if that will give, as you explained, a lot of uh, data and interesting reports afterwards, and hopefully there will be not so much, or not so many. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the case you talked about was handled amicably between, between the parties. That's, that's definitely a good thing to hear. Yep, that worked pretty well. We have a remote question from, I see Peter. Uh, Peter Hesser from Global Ways. Um, I was actually going to comment on that. I'm very happy to see that uh, the code of conduct was used in a way that was not a uh, an attack on a person and was not uh, a punishment on the the party who uh, was the subject of the report. And that um, even though it was was brought to the code of conduct team, the parties were able to uh, resolve it amicably. And I was just just wanted to highlight that was a very nice thing to see. Thank you. Jordi Palet. Um, I understand that uh, we cannot know all the details of every case, but I think it would be good for the community to understand what was the breach or how it was perceived by each side, because that helps the community to say, I am doing something wrong and I have, I have not noticed it. I should avoid that. Yes, but uh, obviously it's hard to go into details without then revealing um, any more specific or personal information. Um, Dinesh, maybe we have... Sorry, sorry. Because um, we have a, a text question here as well, which is in the same vein um, from Antonio Prado. Is, is it possible to know which categories the infringements are? So again, it's a similar, it's a similar uh, request for, for shareable information. But yeah, just to add to that voice to, uh, to that. To, to to that part, basically, um, the the resolved one was more of um, a misunderstanding, and that could be solved by basically talking to them and um, making them aware about that. Okay, and uh, Dinesh Prabhuta from DNS Awak, but I'm talking in personal capacity here. Um, so thank you to the COC team um, for the work that's been done so far. Um, I have a question in terms of the evolution of the COC. And uh, have you had any thoughts on the things that have been done so far and how to make them better for the future? Yes. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> okay. Um, let me expand on that. Um, are there any, uh, well, do you, are you able to expand on your thoughts? Um, not that easy because for me, it's exactly the first time I'm in that and on that meeting. So my experience is exactly mostly for this meeting. Um, but I think we can follow up on that. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Daniel Kahnberg. Web NCC staff member speaking for himself. I would caution us against asking too many statistics and details and stuff uh, from the right code of conduct team. I think this is something that is best not done by and, and evolving the code of conduct uh, and uh, giving recommendations on what the community should do. Uh, is best something that's not engineered by the, the plenary. We should trust the code of conduct team to come back to us if they, by their judgment, uh, something needs to change. Uh, I'm as curious as anyone about what's happening, but I don't think it's appropriate uh, for them to share more than they have shared. Thank you. Thank you. Valerie Aurora, uh, speaking for myself. Uh, uh, yeah, just a quick note that if you do want to know the details of what's happening at the Code of Conduct meetings, you can join the Code of Conduct <laughs> Committee. But you're not allowed to reveal them then. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Hello. I think we don't have anything else online. So thank you very much. And now, before we hand it over to to medium for the closing, Brian, come over for a tradition. I have to take a selfie. Very tradition. It's a very. Say hello, hi, whoa, yay, thank you. So now I'll hand it over to Miriam for the closing remarks. Thank you, thanks um, for running the last plenary session for this meeting and now we are ending the end, we were nearing the end, the, this is the closing plenary. Um, I'm Miriam Kühner, the VIBE Chair, Neil O'Reilly, the VIBE Vice Chair, is online at Miteco um, and, and is participating actually all week and he's been a great help in the background. Um, I miss him here dearly, but um, he's been um, very active in the background to support us all. Um, so just to give you some statistics, um, we had in total 728 attendees checked in. Of those, um, there were 557 on site and 171 um, online. Um, on Miteco, we had 463 um, unique participants, um, of which, um, and, and, and also we had 148 newcomers, um, 112 um, checked in on site and 36 on, online. If you look at the uh, distribution by country, um, we had um, people from, five, uh, from 58 countries um, represented. Um, mostly, Italy didn't quite make it to the top. You know, Germany is still on top, but Italy was the second. Um, but it's good to see such a broad distribution of um, people from various countries um, participate here on site. Um, online, we also have um, quite a large distribution from 41 countries. Um, and well, maybe it's natural that Italy isn't there on the list because they're all here, hopefully. Um, so we'll we'll see others um, there on the on on the chart. Um, I mentioned this at the opening plenary. We had also for the first time we had local hubs. We had six local hubs, and um, this time that basically means you know they all came together in um in a to, together in a room or in, in a university or some some office to participate in the right meeting together. It's a bit like the Eurovision song contest, I guess, you know, you all, you all gather together and then watch the right meeting together. Um, and we had some really nice feedback from them. Some one sent us a feedback saying that it was really helpful and it was very uh, much appreciated to be able to get together and socialize with some other participants and that it enabled them to actually participate for the first time in the right meeting um, in a meaningful manner. So that was really nice to, to hear that feedback. We have some impressions here um, from some of the um, some of the hubs. I don't know why Vesna is there in Estonia, but <laughs> I think this was basically a screenshot from the Estonians on their on their screen. And so Vesna was at the, the hub in the Netherlands, I suspect. Um, but there were also others, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see um, that engagement. And we're going to look at this and evaluate it a bit more um, and, and see what, if that was useful and if we want to repeat this, we, um, what we can improve in the future. Um, these are the NRO and C election results. We had um, elections um, this, this week for the Numbers Resource Organizations Numbers Council um, to fill the seat that James Kennedy had vacated because he joined the right NCC. And I'm happy to um, announce that Constanze Berger has been um, elected. <laughs> Just to show um, who you are, Constanza. I'm overwhelmed. I'm so <laughs> thankful to be a part of the community. Thank you for the trust you gave me. I'm really happy to present you, and I will give you all my skills and um, knowledge to to present your needs in the NAO and C board. I'm really happy to work together with RV and Sander and um, with you all. I'm, I'm open for discussions, talks, and a beer. <laughs> and, and special thanks to, to Randy. Uh, he nominated myself and um, Taha and Sebastian Kavelke, they supported my film. And for my CIO, thank you because I'm able to do this. Thank you so much, I'm thankful. <laughs>
Right. And um, yeah, we have some more people um, to thank here again in the Web Code of Conduct team. And they did a great job um, um, this week. Um, and um, I'm, I'm glad we're seeing this has been a normal part of the right meeting also with the transparency reports at the end. Um, and, um, and as Sebastian said, we're always looking for new volunteers. I was happy that we could add two more people to the team this time. And over time, I hope you're making this uh, um, a larger team so that not everybody has to be at all the right meeting. So that's the idea, right? You have a large team and then we'll see who's available online, on site. Um, so if you're interested, come talk to the Code of Conduct team or come to talk to my, um, myself um, and I'll give you more information. Um, now, the, um, we had some working group chairs who are leaving their roles as working group chairs. Curtis Lindquist was actually been the working group chair for the RIPE NCC services working group from day one um, in um, 20 years ago. Um, he's stepped down now. He said that finally, this is it. I'm not running again. You know, find someone else. Um, <laughs> luckily, that was possible. We also had Rao Damas, who has actually also been in this role at the DNS in the DNS working group for a very long time. His uh, his term ended, and then Benedict Stockerbrand from the IPv6 um, stepped down as the chair of the the co-chair of the IPv6 working group. Thank you all. I wanted to mention also here, Andre and Philippe had stepped on last time as the MAT working group chair. It wasn't clear to me if that was last time or this time. Um, but yes, there is um, also, there was an open um, call for volunteers for the open source um, working group and co-chair and that's been discussed on the on the mailing list right now. So yeah, we have a number of new faces, incoming working group chairs. And we have Doris from, as a co-chair for the DNS working group. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, Janosch for the NCC Services Working Group to replace Curtis. <laughs> we have Alex who kindly stepped in um, to, to kind of you know, replace James, who had to step down um, halfway in his term. Um, so um, Alex is helping out for now, but there will be an open call and another selection before the right meeting, before the next right meeting for the Address Policy Working Group. Congratulations <laughs> or welcome, Alex. Then we have Christian Seitz, who was selected as a co-chair for the IPv6 working group. <laughs> and David was selected as a co-chair for the database working group just after the last um, right meeting. So we didn't actually have him here on the slide last time. So welcome, David. Um, <laughs> so that means this is the full list of working group chairs right now. Um, all those people have done a fantastic job in putting together the agendas of the working groups this week. I think we had a really good um, agenda and very good discussions also in some of the working groups. Um, some working groups were kind of experimenting a bit, like not filling the time only with presentations, but also leaving some space for, for discussion. And I think that worked out really well. Um, yes, you see here all the program committee um, members who were um, you know, responsible for the agenda of the plenary. Um, talks um, and this this week and there are also two that are leaving the program committee and thank you very much Alexander and Dimitro for doing a great job over the last time <laughs> we will miss you on the program committee but we also have two new members on the program committee as Brian has already announced one of them is Valeria Rova and the other is Franziska Lichtblau who will come back to the PC after at a break, basically. <laughs> I'm not sure how we're going to do this with all these gifts. I think the PC going to, we'll wait until the end of the PC because we have some other winners. Um, the tradition is to um, award some people who have been like quick in registering and we do a raffle amongst uh, a few groups. So now this time we have a raffle amongst the local people, the local participants here from Italy. So Antonio Prado and Marco Dietri, uh, if you're in the room, um, please come up and receive a small gift as appreciation to be um, participating um, here and be quick in registering. And um, Kajal and one man who actually is a good opportunity to introduce you because uh, Kajal and one man will be the um, be very active in organizing the right meetings from now on so you'll see their faces.
and then oh you're ready oh it's so efficient wonderful and so we have a new two newcomers that we want to give prizes to Stephen Davidson and Katarina Liasa if you're here in the room yes Katarina yeah you can also give tickets Katarina are you here I don't see yeah you're here right yeah I saw I thought you saw I saw you please pick up your your gift over there thanks for being a newcomer yes and um, thanks for being a newcomer and for registering um, uh, for this white meeting. Actually, some of the gifts are the uh, books that um, some colleagues from Namex are um, have kindly contributed um, for, to as gifts for um, for our participants. And then, um, importantly, also after the newcomers talk on the Monday, we did a, a Kahoot um, test or a Kahoot um, um, what's it called? Quiz, thank you. Um, there were two people who um, won, and the one is RSC224. We don't know who you are, so please find us um, if you would like to receive your gift, and then we can still hand it to you or send it to you. And the other one is Katarina Stefanovic, if you're in the room. Mm, I don't see her. Maybe we can still find her, her later. Um, but yeah, that was fun. That was fun quiz. So, um, and then newcomers, um, it's good to see newcomers participating so actively. Um, there's some feedback to fill in. Um, please provide us feedback about this meeting and about what meetings in, in general. And if you've missed anything, um, there is another selfie that Max and Jan did uh, earlier this week. Um, there are the, the links to the meeting archives, um, the presentation archives for all the presentations, and also a daily meeting blog that the RIPE NCC keeps and with the main highlights of the um, of, of the meeting. It's really fun, fun to read. Um, and then lastly, I would like to thank all our sponsors and obviously the hosts from Namex and then the Web NCC contributed a lot, not only in staff resources, but also um, in um, um, financial resources. There was um, Oracle and Verisign and IP um, before Global, Cisco, NTT, the Internet Society and Colt as the connectivity sponsor. So thanks to all the sponsors. Um, they contributed a lot. And be before I move on, actually, I want to maybe give you all the PC members you give, otherwise it gets a little out of hand here. <laughs> so if the PC members who are still here and who are in the room would come up um, so you can see them. Also those who have um, um, who stepped down this term, I don't know, Dimitri or Alex, if you're in the room, I'd specifically like to thank you again in person. Can you go over there so she can take a nice picture of you? Um, and one minute and Kajal will um, hand you some the closing sen the closing plenary is always a bit ceremonial so um <laughs> great thank you all um please <laughs> And of course, a huge thank you to the organization team. Um, Sandra, I don't know if you're in the room. Yes, there you are. Thanks, Sandra. She did like beyond you know, what you can do. And, and of course, also the other um, um, the colleagues from the um, events organizers, you know, the organization team, the tech team, um, everybody who has um, contributed to making this um, right meeting possible. Um, so now I would like to um, introduce the next right meeting, RIPE 88, will be in Krakow in Poland. And we have a short presentation here uh, from the local host. Um, there will be Akamai next time who will host us in Krakow in Poland. Um, yes, the host. And then I want to close this. Yes, no, 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 that's good. <laughs> He's coming up, he's coming up in a second. Um, just want to close this with our new RIPE logo that we have, um, you know, you've seen already before in the community plenary. And so from that, from next on, next meeting on, you will also see them, that, that new logo on the slides. So um, thank you all. This is all from me. Um, I'd like to give the floor to the um, local host for the next RIPE meeting um, to say a few words. And then um, I wish you 
you know, nice lunch. Oh yeah, maybe one now at the lunch. This time we'll, we only have one lunch room. That's the one if you come up to the right, kind of the larger break, breakfast room. Um, that's where we will have lunch. And then I, I wish you a great trip home and I hope to see all of you again next time. Hello, all of you. Uh, I'll promise this is only going to be half an hour to 45 minute sales pitch, <laughs> maximum. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Patrick Busman. I'm speaking with my Akamai hat on, I think for the first time this week. I'm trying to differentiate by wearing the right hoodies, so that might make, <laughs> make it correctly. Um, I have the pleasure of inviting you to Krakow, and I wanted to say two or three sentences because that might be a confusing thing to see a German standing up on the stage, uh, in an American company inviting you to Krakow, Poland. So bear with me for two seconds there. It's like Akamai has a 13-year history with over a thousand employees. That's actually our biggest office outside of the US, and we nearly have all engineering departments there. So we have a huge heritage there. We're highly invested. We're highly invested in the local women and diversity groups. We're invested in the university programs. We're invested in the um, academia exchange. We actually have classes powered by Akamai on the local universities. And we're active in the NOC organizations there. So you're going to see a lot of more local faces and not the Americans and the Germans on stage there. That's all I'm going to say about Akamai. And then I think my job here is to make you interested and tainted to come to Krakow and we want to all see you there. So why Krakow and why did we think Krakow would be an amazing place to have a right meeting? Like the combination of hysterical, traditional, proud heritage with a modern thriving university city, a city that is highly invested into technology while ensuring work-life balance by driving one of the greenest and family friendliest cities that we've ever seen. Um, and an active day and night life where you can basically spend your whole night evolving through the city from whatever entertainment part you would like. We thought this fits actually very well with the values of the RIPE community. Um, we wanted to give back. We wanted to see you all there. Um, we wanted to introduce you to Krakow. So two or three recommendations, and then I'll leave you with that. Um, recommendation one, as someone who's been to Krakow on a very regular basis and who's deeply missed that while being out on COVID. Arrive early, go late. There is so much to see, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, you have, just as an example, two UNESCO World Heritage on your fingertips that you can see by just going out there. Um, and you have plenty to go through the city. So how to prepare? Krakow is well connected to most of Europe. You can fly, you can take a bus, you can take, uh, take a train. English is well understood pretty much everywhere. The currency is not yet Euro, and I'm going controversial there. I fully acknowledge that. <laughs> Here is where we are. As a German, I want to point out, you can use a credit card nearly in every place. <laughs> it was important for me because I was approached by a couple of people throughout the week. I wanted to be very clear on that. Krakow, from everything that I've seen, from everything that the company has seen, from everything that all the diverse groups that we speak to on a regular basis has seen, is a very open, very young, very thriving, safe and diverse city. And they will welcome you with open arms and make your life and stay there very enjoyable. So with that, I hope to see you all in Krakow next year. We welcome you there. If you can anything, do anything for you, how about, please reach out. Happy to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to this. And I promised you that you won't see me again, but I forgot one important thing. And that's actually a big, big thank you to the local host. And we also had a token of appreciation for the local host that the um, events team had organized. So Maurizio, or I don't know who is here from Namex, if you could come up um, and um, get some gifts handed to you.
great. The whole team is here. Fantastic. <laughs> so Kajal and Juan Min are going to hand over the gift. Just to say a few words, I would like to thank uh, all the RIPE community and especially the RIPE ACC uh, for the amazing job. Uh, thank you so much. We will. Uh, we was really happy to host you, and we try to do our best. I hope it works. Thank you so much. <laughs> Special thanks uh, from me uh, to Sandra on your side because uh, we worked with her and was an, an amazing job. And let me thank my wonderful team, uh, Alessandra, Luca, and uh, our newcomer, Marta. Thank you so much. <laughs> also, let me thank Marco, our technician, who was, was back to work, and Flavio, they got sick, but uh, that uh, say hello to you. And uh, so, uh, see you in Krakow. <laughs> I just forgot that we have a present for the Rapsin CC staff. It, it can be only that the pasta for you. So. <laughs> Miriam, we also have a timer. A timer? Oh, yeah, for the pasta, because on the, well, uh, above Rome, uh, people uh, get too, many, too, too much time for the pasta cooking. So you have to uh, follow the rules. So please follow the rule. This is the tools. And then thank you so much, Miriam. And at the very end, I would like to also do a big thanks to the stenographers. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And there are many other... Co there are many other communities who are very jealous of our um, stenographers that we have um, had here for the right meeting for so many years. And they're looking at us and I'm with envy. Um, and I, I hope this has been useful for you, um, for your participation. So thanks again. <laughs> But first of all, there's a timer down here. The secret working group's representatives wait for no person. <laughs> so, I, um, I've not been here before. I normally just make tea and coffee for these shady people. But uh, I'm here because, as some of you may have noticed, this is a super spreader event. And we have a few people who are not very well. More on that later. Normal service, I'm assured, will be resumed. However, welcome to Rome. But first, the standing rules apply. No photos. No Twitch. No Facebook. No telegram. No X or some bluebird. <laughs> no YouTube. No Insta. No TikTok. No WhatsApp. And no why. <laughs> why? Why not? Exactly. X was taken. <laughs> For a long time, we've talked to you about splat. Now, Somebody has actually come up with a platform called Splat. We demand intellectual property rights, but Splat is still the only official social media platform of the secret working group. 
However, down to business, and Comic Sans is serious business. In magenta and Comic Sans delight, a presentation surprisingly right, with whimsical font, each point was upfront. Who knew Comic Sans could shine so bright? And, uh, and I'm forced to tell you that even we agree that this is a very, very worthy recipient of the Rob Bloxell Award. And congratulations to the calligrapher to, to actually put the, the Comic Sans drawing. Yes, yes, th this, this was hand-drawn Comic Sans. <laughs> and, uh, apparently, I've heard they had to tell the, the uh, calligraphy artist several times, no, we really, really want you to do this. <laughs> because it's a reasonable question, are you sure? <laughs> and, and, and we were able to use this uh, Comic Sans uh, as, as something from Ripe Labs. Uh, sorry, the Ripe Labs, we're overtaking them. The secret working group labs. <clears throat> Obviously, um, artificial intelligence is all the rage these days. And uh, we don't like to get left behind the technology curve. So the secret working group labs have been working with a machine learning and as you can see, this is some of our early prototype designs. Our goal is to ensure two things. Number one, all natural language models speak in poetry because that's the only way to speak. And number two, that they adopt Comic Sans. <laughs> we, um, we received this uh, interesting contribution about the round trip time for a golf ball. <laughs> and I guess, I guess that really depends on how good your golfing is. And I think the Venn diagram intersection of our community and golfers is pretty thin in the middle, I'd like to think. <laughs> so the round trip time for a golf ball could be measured in days. Yeah, flat whites are fine. They are. In a quiet Italian barista's domain, requests for Americanos cause disdain. She stood firm, eyes aglow, no Americano to go, expresses the heart of this coffee campaign. And this is all you get, no more, no less. Yep. We, uh, we think that we've had some sort of media elements here from, from what I've heard. Yeah. In media where bias holds sway, Fake news often comes out to play with a slant and a spin. Truth wears a thin green as facts in the headlines decay. And we are in the undisputed land of pizza and pasta. So uh, the secret working group kitchens were doing some analysis. All over, attempts are amiss to replicate Italian food bliss. The copies fall short and taste buds retort. Poor replicas living dinners in abyss. And as you can see here, the, the first one is the one that, that, that we would recommend. I don't know, this second photo, I don't know what they're doing there. It's, yep. it's clearly rubbish. But it needs to have pineapple. Uh, it does have pineapple. That has to have pineapple, yes. And it's to be frozen. Of course, yes. Uh, now, some of you may have noticed in this uh, lovely venue, it's been a bit airtight. Room air supply fails. Masks like this did not descend. <laughs> Quick, outside to breathe. It was a haiku. <laughs> And we always have to have a sonnet, uh, which, as the duty Englishman, it falls to me to read. <laughs> Occupational hazard. Smell the coffee, a sonnet. In realms where meetings bloom far, far away, through buildings vast, a complex maze to sway. Buses, taxis, and shuttles roam, misguided paths become a traveler's poem. The lunch, a beacon in this tangled scheme, 
an excellent repast, a savory dream. Yet coffee's aroma, a distant call, a trek from the main room, a stroll for all. The journey unfolds with each weary stride, a quest for caffeine where patience is tried. Almost forever the venue unfolds, a saga of steps in tales yet untold. Yet amidst the odyssey, lunch is embrace. In this vast venue, a nourishing grace. The land of far, far away. <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed it. We have. It's been an interesting venue. And we will see you in Krakow in the Salt Mines. Thank you. Thank you.